All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is June 20th, 2023, the first day of summer. Well, you know what that does, right? That eliminates another piece that we were looking at as a possible connection, something that's been happening over the years that we look at. And I'm going to show you what it is. This is a real quick little side note here. Wasn't planned. Oh, my goodness. I got so many things open. My computer's yelling at me. If you guys remember this, uh, the lessons of the fig tree, uh, the parable of the fig tree, da, 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 uh, talking in relation to summer, right? In verse 30. And they, when they now shoot forth, you see and know for your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. Now, we had this conversation. So we knew that this time was going to come and go because we didn't have the eight days that came before it, right? That seven to the eighth day that came before it. So we were aware that today into tomorrow and this stuff wasn't going to happen. And I had mentioned in a previous video that only this or what we're going to talk about again more tonight is that whole fifth to seventh month in in the revelation of that understanding what god is here how it began years ago and i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna do something that I, that i've often done over the years when new revelation comes when new important revelation comes and i'm going to show you some other examples but what i spoke about in the previous video about this is that either this relation in the discourse is about summer wasn't to actually tell us that it was going to be when summer's about to start, okay? It, it, it's, it's an analogy, right? It's to say, just as you see these things happen and, and the branches, the fig tree and all the trees, when they begin to shoot forth and you know that summer is near, the same kind of way as you're observing these things, you're gonna know that it's near at hand. That's what it's saying. And this is something that we've spoken about, we've covered this uh, a number of times over the years, that it was either going to be a, a, a typology or, or, or a direct thing telling us, hey, it means summer is near, and, and that's the assessment it's giving us, or we have another count that goes to the fifth and seventh month, which is the final count for the 70th year. So it was either going to be that the fifth and seventh was like a, an analogy that reveals to us the 50 days or summer was the real thing and summer was where the count was going to be and then it was going to be 50 days only one of those two were going to be correct and this one is now done all right and i think you're going to realize <laughs> when you see the things that we're going to go through tonight you're pay attention watch carefully understand it Pause it, rewind, seek and search these things out, and you'll see for yourselves that we have understood this for about five years, in part, okay? It's been building and building and building and building, and it's never left our thoughts. It's always been there. We took a, a pause on it for about a year and a half or so because there were certain things that we couldn't understand and in how that I couldn't understand, I should say, in how it, it didn't, how was it supposed to connect in relation to Taurus? And we struggled with that. I struggled with that for a long time. Well, hold on to your horses because I know this video was a, was a big video to follow. Yeah, you, you really needed to be around for a while to really grasp it. And, you know, I, I should be surprised. I know a number of you grasped it, you know, but it wasn't an easy one. And I know it wasn't an easy one. But like so many other things, when these revelations come and fill those spots where they should fill in, it's, it's always difficult at first, but then it becomes part of our conversation. And you'll know what I'm talking about when we get to it. We've seen this happen many, many times here in the ministry. So with that, I want to say thank you, everybody, for your prayers, for my daughter, uh, for our, our brother Steve in Uganda and his daughter. You know, I guess uh, the medications appear to be working. Um, I could speak. I know Steve's daughter's doing well. 
Um, and my daughter, uh, she, like I said, she went to the hospital. My wife took her there. Uh, my daughter's 17, by the way. And uh, they gave her new antibiotics. So this is the fourth round, different antibiotics. And um, uh, she's booked in with a specialist. So it's not that she's, uh, that she can't go about and go do things, but she has some pains. And, um, you know, the other was weren't working. And so prayerfully, this round is going to work and it will hold off uh, until she can get to a specialist. Unfortunately, like in so many places, specialists, uh, it could take two, three months, sometimes even more uh, to see the specialist. So prayerfully, these uh, antibiotics will work and it will be fine. And she, when she goes to see the specialist, it'll be great. However, if we've finally understood, and this truly, truly is the 70th year, as has been revealed, going all the way back to the count from Christ, which we didn't even need, by the way, but was also revealed from the count from Christ like it has never been done before because we here in this ministry have been given the revelation of the open gospels, the 14 years, and the books that have opened. It is the revelation of the 14 years that was able to prove it and give us the count all the way back. And when we did, it lined up with all the pieces of Scripture. All these bits and parts and pieces of Scripture line themselves up all the way back. All right? So we're here, guys. And, you know, like I said, I we're hoping and praying, right? It's never been an audible. It's never been a dream or a vision. It has been the opening of the books. It has been a spirit-led revelation journey for just about, you know, five and a half, getting close to six years now in this journey. And I'll tell you what, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It, I, I'm still as blown away by it today as I was when I first started to realize what was happening. I don't freak out as much as I did. I don't cry as much as I did. But I certainly spend a lot of time in prayer with the Lord and, and asking questions and scratching my head and saying, okay, Lord, we need more. You know, we, there has to be more pieces. There, there needs to be more revelation to tie it more knitly together as this time is so close. And that's why I think this last video was such a big deal. Because in the midst of it, you heard me freak out over something that was revealed as it was happening in that video. Okay, not only was the revelation of Jeremiah 25 a big deal, and it was hard to follow, you know, after 70, yet at the start of 70, you know, how did, how, how did that all play? Well, we're going we're gonna to simplify it. We're going to clear it up. We're going to show the things that led to this, the things that led to the fifth and seventh month to understand 70 years, to start it and to end it. And it, it's incredible. It really is incredible. And when you really pause to understand the, the, that piece of revelation from Matthew 4, from Isaiah 9 confirming it, my goodness, my goodness. It, it was showing us about two months from his birth. I mean, it, it's absolutely incredible. Exactly what we've been looking for. And so it's that type of thing that when we get a detail like that, you see, we've understood the fifth and seventh month for years. We've had the right on target and bullseye as, as the beginning of the year, but we didn't know how to understand it as the beginning. And so we've been seeking that and then seeking it with the 70th year, seeking it with the Feast of Weeks count and a Pentecost count that follows. And it was always trying to discern these things together, but they could happen in any year time frame, but until it's the 70th, right? So we never really know if we've got it until the events happen. And when the events happen, we'll know it was the true 70th year. And so we're going to talk about that. We're going to build it and prove it out even more. But that little, that little piece, you see how important it was of, of that two months difference. Here's why it was important. We're not talking about a period of time where the Lord gives now revelation of something that's months, years in account still to go. The Spirit led in this piece to say, here you go. 
right in the midst of the last video. There's your difference of two months. There's your two months. You kept thinking it was exactly on his birthday because of the wording. Well, the truth was it was already revealed that it was about two months. And it just so happened that we've known that for a few years now. That's why it was so awesome. So we're going to go into these things that led us to that. We're going to make a couple of other fun little side note shares along the way. Um, uh, our brother Michael from Australia shared one from our brother Ben. And I think Ben, oh, I can't remember where Ben's from. He's either South Africa, I think, if I'm not mistaken, maybe Australia as well. Um, it's just a little side note, a little fun little point that we're going to make. And then another one that our brother Roy shared with me today that I thought was awesome. And, and when you see it, it's, it's not huge, but the revelation of it is so much of a big deal because you guys will remember spirit portion is Luke, light portion is Mark, flesh portion is Matthew, right? It's the pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. It's the bride of Christ. It's the, it's the world, Gentiles, house of Israel, and Judah, right? Spirit, light, flesh. It's awesome. You'll see. We'll get to there in just a minute. So as, as always, anybody that's new to this ministry, you want to come to this playlist right here. This playlist right here called the Revealed End Time Study Note Series, you can find it in two places. You can find Don't it let... here on YouTube in this playlist right here, or you can find it on ministryrevealed.com. Okay, this is the homepage for ministryrevealed.com. It's right here on the homepage, but you see it gives you a link page, or you can come over here to the menu, go to the intro, and you can find them all here as well. This is a 22-minute intro video that gives you the groundwork for what you're going to see you're going to see in this 30 minute bible study this first one which is the revelation of who the gospels are speaking to it's going to blow your mind if you've ever had questions about the differences within the gospels with a focus in the synoptic gospels of Matthew Mark and Luke which in the end is Luke Mark and Matthew it's going to blow your mind the the purpose for these differences within the gospels is all prophetic it's crazy. You're going to see things like Jesus going to the cross was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, beautiful. In Mark, he was arrayed in purple. In Matthew, he was arrayed in scarlet. What? How is that possible? It was prophetic. You're going to see things like Jesus' last words on the cross in Luke was, into your arms, I commend my spirit, right? He says to the Father. Yet in Mark and Matthew, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The word forsaken means leave behind. Did Jesus think he was going to be left behind? No. So why were those two left behind? Well, isn't it interesting that purple and scarlet are tribulation colors? Then what you're going to find out is that this second 30-minute Bible study is the revelation of the end of days, which is not seven years that the world has told you, but 14 years. Now, that's good news for pre-trib. <laughs> it doesn't sound so good for the rest, but it's great news for pre-trib because that means it's going to be seven years sooner than it would have been if it was only seven years of tribulation. The only way you're going to come to understand 14 years and this portion called above 14 years, which is a short period of time, is by first understanding why are there these differences in the Gospels? Why are the, why are the discourses so different, especially Luke. But so is Mark from Matthews. Matthews goes even extended. It goes into Matthew chapter 25. It's going to blow you away. If you've ever had questions on these things and you've been seeking and digging into prophecy or just digging into scripture and, and been confused on how all these things can fit into seven years, why in Revelation 14 is Jesus on Mount Zion with 144,000? Doesn't that sound like then Jesus is here on, on, a, on a Mount Zion of type, because the 144,000 are about to go out. Why does Ezekiel 39 say they're going to be burning weapons for seven years if Ezekiel 39 is the beginning of tribulation of seven years? That's a head-scratcher, isn't it? Not when you understand the truth of the revelation of the end of days.
And then what you're going to see is this big one right here. This one's about two hours and 45 minutes. And you're going to see the title is perfect for it. It's called It's All Because of Matthew. And why that title is because for centuries, we have all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. So everybody's foundational understanding, without them being aware of it, as they go to read other parts of Scripture, their foundation always comes from the perspective of Matthew. That's why there's been arguments over pre, mid, post. Turns out, they're all true. Luke is pre, Mark is mid, Matthew's post. Luke's is the above 14 years. Mark's is the seventh year of seals. That's why it's between the sixth seal, the end of the sixth seal, and before the seventh seal, the great multitude rapture. And then you've got Matthew, which is when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Pre, mid, and post is all true. And it's all revealed in a portion called 14 years and a piece called above. From there, we have the next section, which is going deeper. So that other part was just to introduce you. That, that intro video was to introduce you to the three videos that followed that would begin to open up the revelation for you. That is what's happened here in this ministry for over five and a half years. I was knowingly aware that it started on September 8th, 2017. Okay? I, I knew it. There's a video of it. It all began there, and it's been a ride ever since. Now you're going to get into some heavier stuff. This one here is like a three-hour video going deeper into the revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to. Then you've got this one. The discourse is revealed. Luke, Mark, and Matthew all in order. Mind blower. Absolute mind blower. Pre, mid, and post revealed in the Gospels. Understanding the tribulation from... Revelation chapter 6 to Revelation chapter 14, it's, it's, it's really going to blow your mind. The revelation of the seven churches for the end of days, no way you could have understood it without the revelation of 14 years, and so on and so on. Some incredible, incredible videos, and then one that's just a mind blower. This one, it's all a fractal. This takes it all the way back to the beginning of creation, and from the beginning of creation, to the end of the millennial reign is the literal revelation of the end of days. It's really that crazy, guys. It is going to blow your mind, and it's worth every moment that you take to spend watching it. I promise you. You can also do it from here on the YouTube channel as well, except for some reason I haven't added the uh, 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 It's All a Fractal. All right, so you can get this here in on youtube as well all right man i uh every time i do the intro videos and i go into that guys i can get so lost in that i i mean i mean literally in my thoughts and i can go on for hours and hours and hours just going through every video without even playing them and break them all down for you as i talk without even playing them it's it's so beautiful it is so perfect. It becomes so clear. It's awesome. It's so exciting. So uh, one of the other questions that we've had, uh, one of the sisters asked is, we would had this conversation uh, for a little while now about, well, what about the moon? You know, are we still going to have to account for the moon being 10 days off? Right? What about the moon? Do we... You know, if the sun, we've realized and we found it, and the sun relates to the month of Savan, that was the beginning with Moses, do we need to still account for the moon? And the answer is no. You know, I've gone back and forth on that so many times. And, you know, it happens with so many things that we dig into and we're seeking and we're searching. Is we, it doesn't, you know, we appear to have clarity. And then all of a sudden we get something about the moon and we're able to track it. I mean, we're literally able to track the moon. We did it about a year and a half ago and it was mind blowing because we know how the Hebrew calendar works. However, if you do that, then you're never going to be observing, for example, 
Passover on the 14th day, counting from new moon, then to the crucifixion, which is the 15th of Nisan, and then resurrection early in the morning, which is the 16th. You have to have the full moon in there. You see, this is something we shared in the past. You remember how um, even when Jesus was here, when Jesus was here and they knew it was Nisan, they knew that it was based on barley and Abib and everything else. And the crucifixion had to happen from the 14th, right? Through the, the 15th, 16th resurrection. It had to be with a full moon. It had to start from the first month. Well, the only way to understand that is with the moon. So even though the moon goes off course, one thing we could always do is go to the sun, moon, and stars. So if we're going to the sun, moon, and stars, and we're going to the constellations to establish the month, and then we go to the sun to establish what month it is based on where the sun is, and then we go to the moon and where the moon is in that constellation with the sun to start the month, then the story solved. The calendars would go off, but when you see how the Hebrew calendar adjusts for these things, it's always on track, always. The only difference is you might have where it's, you know, they say this is the 15th and really according to the sun, moon, and stars, it might be that it's a month early, okay? Because they have these things preset. So most cases it's right on, but in some cases it might be a difference of a day earlier. That's generally what happens. You see, it always brings me back, and we'll talk about it a little bit as well as we get further in, but I guess we'll talk less about this and more about other stuff. But um, like we spoke about with the original 14thers, right? The original Christians, those that were sticking to the true feasts, didn't go follow the churches, right? What the, what the church was doing at the time with Rome. And, you know, they were willing to put their necks on the line. They were willing to die. For one portion of their causes, there were more than one cause, but one of the causes was they were being accused of, of following the 14th day of the first month. Why would they be willing to put their necks on the line and die and, and be ridiculed being called 14thers, <laughs> which for anybody that's new, we're called 14ers. I had no idea it existed that there were 14thers until several months, maybe close to a year later when somebody emailed it to me. I was simply calling us 14ers in this ministry because of the revelation of 14 years. And then it turned out there was a group of people that were the original Christians that were 14thers. Crazy, right? They did it because they stuck to the truth of the 14th day. We're called that because we're sticking to the truth of the revelation of the 14 years, days to years, years to days. Oh, I love it, man. But anyways, why would they be willing to stick their necks on the line to say, no, we know when it's the 14th day based on this of the 14th day of the first month. You see, 2,000 years ago, the sun was off by one month, right? So now it's off by two. But even though it was off by one, they still knew when the 14th day was. The only way they could know that was by the moon. So the moon, even 2,000 years ago, was off in its counts on a monthly basis. Yet they still knew to observe the 14th day of the first month. How could they have done it without the moon? You see, they had to establish the month, they had to establish the, the crop, and they had to establish the sun there with the moon. It's the only way to do it. So when we've read things like Jubilees that says that many will observe in the time of the end, you know, the difference of 10 days, well, the Hebrew calendar makes these accounts for it. And the only way for you to go and check is to go look up at the sun where it is in a constellation when the moon gets there and follow it through for the 28, 29, 30 days, follow it through and see where the sun is then on the other side of that constellation and when the, month, the moon starts the new month. Okay, so I think we've got that down. It, it, it's clear now. We don't have to worry about this difference anymore. So we'll get to a point where I'm going to show it to you and what it looked like in Moses' time as well. But check this out. 
Look at this. This is from May 11th, 2018. This is one of those things I wanted to show you guys. So I was freaking out. I, I had only been doing this now since, uh, remember, September 8th. I started in June, but September 8th was when I knew something had happened in 2017 and, and everything changed in my life because I was starting to understand things. At this video here, man, not in the video, but I was freaking out a bit in the video. But when the revelation of this video came, I, I was freaking out, man. I, it was, remember, this is still only about seven or so months since I knew everything had changed. And I was, I was starting to understand things as I read. And I wasn't even really reading the King James or any Bible. I was just listening to people and occasionally reading. I was getting confused by thou, these, that. It was just, I never understood it. It was hard to understand. And then suddenly I could understand it. I could read through it. I was understanding where connections were. I wasn't hearing audibles. I wasn't getting dreams, visions, none of that stuff. And everything just started clicking. And everywhere I was reading, it was clicking and clicking and clicking. Well, this one was one of those huge ones. This was that, uh, if you guys remember, it was the revelation of the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. You see, I got so many things open, it kicked me all the way back to the beginning. It was the revelation of the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. So when does the Lord come on heavenly Mount Zion? He doesn't come for the pre-trib group on heavenly Mount Zion, right? So. The question is, what was this all about? Let me get to it here. I just want you guys to see it because I'm making a point with it as well. It was so, so exciting. Look at how far back this is. I had no idea. Here it is right here. Like, see, I was trying to find the best image I could. I couldn't properly find one. And I, I just like, man, it was such a big deal. And you see, what I did is when I first did the video, it was so exciting, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily the easiest to follow because everything was still kind of new. And then I did a follow-up video, His Return and the Coming Mountain. And what did we come to know from this? Well, it was the revelation, and we're going to talk about it as we go further in, but it's the revelation of like Zechariah chapter 8. So we know that at the end of the sixth seal, the Lord is coming on heavenly Mount Zion. We knew that it was, it was connected to the, the seals events in Daniel 7, and then the Lord coming on the mountain, right? Going to the cloud, being brought to the Lord, to, to the Father. We read the end of the sixth seal. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's not, everybody, you see, what the church has told us is they sandwich them together. That seals and trumpets over, overlay over each other and they're going to be happening together. Well, they have to do that. They have to do that because they don't understand 14 years. They mix it all up and throw it all together. That's why they're confused about pre, mid, and post. But when we understood seven months earlier the revelation of the gospel's beginning, when we understood six months earlier the revelation of the 14 years, when this revelation came about, oh my goodness. I, I was freaking. I was freaking out. It was it was one of the biggest things ever, besides the revelation of the gospels in the fourteen years. It was the evidence of what we're seeing at the end of the sixth seal and why they're freaking out and saying rocks and mountains fall on us. It was the revelation of Second Ezra chapter thirteen, starting verse twenty nine. You know the escape, then them planning to make war, neighbor against neighbor, kingdom against kingdom. And then it says all these other things that I've already told you about. And then you're going to see my son coming. Right? He's, he's, that, he's coming with that, that mountain carved without hand. That becomes a mountain, right? That stone with carved from a mountain with, sorry, that stone that becomes a great mountain carved without hand. You see, it, it was incredible, but that wasn't the end of trumpets. Because it's the end of trumpets is when he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. So what was he coming with? What is he coming with at the end of the sixth seal? He's coming on paradise. What? Could you imagine? We're talking about six years and change from now. The Ezekiel 39 war where everybody's freaking out, but they're going to come and fight. It's just like Ezra's. Second Ezra's chapter 13, about verse 29 down. 
it is literally a, a, a big picture overview of the six years of seals to the Lord coming at the end of the sixth year of seals. And then we'll take care of business during the seventh year. It's awesome. But you see, it started with this and then we got another one, right? To bring some clarity to it, to connect more pieces to it. Well, you'll also remember another one that had happened with um, the, uh, what was it? Um, the 13 years. Remember the revelation that was always 14 years, 14 years, and it is 14 years. But what happens is the Lord's actually coming down, feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end of 13. And he's going to complete that, seventh, that, that 14th year. And what came about with that was that, you guys remember, I was in the shower and I had so many things, so many revelations, like final little pieces just click when I'm in the shower. It has happened so many times. You guys that have been around for a while know the story. Well, with that one, I was talking, I was just in prayer and I was like, Lord, but how is that if it's after 14, then what about this to that? And, you know, there, there seems to be something going on in this final year. And then all of a sudden, in my thoughts, it wasn't an audible or anything like that. Just in my, my own words, like my own kind of voice in my head, it was just after 13 fulfills the 14. And I was like, what? And as soon as I thought that, as soon as that came to my thoughts, that was a Holy Spirit drop. And as soon as that happened, I had like five, six pieces of scripture all start flooding my thoughts. And every one of them was after 13, the 14th, after 20th, the 21st, 13, 14th. It's the revelation of, of uh, uh, Abraham and he has Ishmael. And then Abraham, he was 80, what was he? He was 86 years old. 13 years later, he's 99 years old and God makes a covenant with him. Everybody gets circumcised. It says Ishmael is 13 years old. And then what happens? Bang. He turns 14. Uh, he turns 14. Um, uh, uh, Abraham turns 100 and Jesus shows up the promise, right? The Isaac shows up. I mean, it was everywhere. It was in the story of Jacob with Leah and Rachel with the cattle after 20 years, because that's the big picture, right? That goes back to that fractal video. It's connected to Jacob in the story of seven years, gets Leah, was expecting Rachel, works seven more years to complete for Rachel. Then he works six more for the cattle. And then he makes a covenant after 20 years. That's the same easy seven years of the bride being prepared for Luke. Then the escape. Then you've got seven years of seals. That's the Rachel portion. You got six more years of cattle and the Lord coming at the 13th year. The cattle is a representation of Judah. We've showed it even in another recent video. I mean, these things have happened over and over and over again. Do you guys remember another awesome one? Remember this one? Uh, let me scroll back. This, I think it's a little bit further back. And, and my point is to say, when these revelations come, there's more detail that gets added to them. And that's what happened with this. This one, oh, I felt like this guy in the field, just arms up like, yes, Lord. It was so beautiful because we understood in the, in the transfiguration stories of Luke, Mark, and Matthew, Mark after six days was a typology of after six years. Matthew's typology of after six days was after six years of trumpets. Mark's was six years of seals. Matthew's was six years of trumpets. And we understood it. We've been teaching it. We had been teaching on it for quite a while. And, and, and that's the transfiguration. You see the Lord coming. And it's after six years of seals. Remember what we said? The 14ers were days. And here we've got 14ers that were years, right? It's, it's everywhere. And so what had baffled me for the longest time was why Luke's was about in eight days. And when it hit me, oh man, was it awesome. And it had a, it had a dual thing in it, right? What happened is remember Jacob, there was seven easy years that he worked and then he got Leah expecting Rachel. Then he gets Rachel, but he has to work seven more years. Then he did six for the cattle. You see, it's the same typology. These were the easy seven years. This is where the bride is being prepared. And then she's gone above 14 years. 
We're going to touch on that in a moment. And so what had happened was, well, if you look in the bigger picture, if this is what? After six days as years, you see, end of the sixth seal, he's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. Then what do we have? Matthew's portion. Matthew has six years of trumpets, the six days as years. And then what happens after the 13th? The Lord returns, confirms the covenant that he had made earlier, and he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it confirms over and over and over again. So what was the about an eighth day? Well, just like Mark and Matthew's were a type of after six years for Mark and after six years for Matthew, Luke's was about an eighth day. Why was it about an eighth day? Because the bride, the Luke portion, is going almost at the eighth year. See how awesome that is? The, the, the transfigurations themselves revealed it. It's his coming pre, his coming mid, his coming post. It was so exciting. But then what else, what else did it do? Well, that eighth day had a dual meaning. Because we know when the Lord returns, when he comes as the son of man, the pre-trib escapes, the bride of Christ, the Gentile bride is going at the beginning of 50 days. There's the seven-day wedding in heaven, and then what happens? The Lord returns on the eighth day. Just like the wedding with Leah, right? Fulfill her week. It's the seven-day wedding, and then the Lord's coming as the Son of Man on the eighth day. So the eighth day had a dual meaning as coming back on the eighth day as the Son of Man, and which he's going to be here for 40 days. We're going to touch on a bit again. and we know that it's because it's saying about an eighth day as years because it's almost the eighth year. Whereas Mark and Matthew said after six and after six. So awesome. It's just such a beautiful, beautiful thing to comprehend it. There's been so many, there have been so many videos like that. And you see, when somebody new comes in now and, and you start to understand it, it just becomes part of the vocabulary. You're like, okay, yep. Yeah. You know, we don't talk about uh, the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion like it's a, an overly big deal in our understanding anymore. Because we've known it now for five years. I can't believe that's been five years already. I thought it was four. But it just becomes commonplace. And that's the kind of thing that you're going to see. It's happened over and over and over again. And that's why we're going to cover these things so that it becomes easily understood and you could follow it and you could track it all the way through so let me show you a little fun piece this was shared through uh from michael but from uh, our brother ben so what we're looking for is we're talking about what the fasting of the morning of the fifth month which is the ninth of av and the other one is the fasting in the morning of the seventh month now, they do it on the 3rd of Tishri, but the actual event happened on Tishri 1, okay? It was right here that the event actually happened, okay? So, we, we know this count. It's, it's exactly 50 days. Well, the 9th of Av, okay, is the beginning of the 50 days. This is right here, right before, right here is the 7th Sabbath. So right in this time, right here to right here is the pre-trib, is the believed pre-trib escape based on all of the revelation of 70 years that we've revealed. We'll check it out. What month is it? July, right? Who's going, Jews? Well, there's probably some Jews, right? Some Messianic believers. But who's the bride portion? The first wedding is the Gentile bride. So isn't it interesting that on the Gentile calendar, it's what? The seventh month, 26th day. You guys all know what 726 is, right? Everybody that studies Bible prophecy knows what 726 is. 726, let's go to it real quick. 726, well, here, let me just pull it up right here. 726 is 
everybody's favorite word, harpazo, right? To seize, to carry off by force, to snatch out or snatch away. It's the Greek word harpazo. So when people say, oh, there is no rapture, this is the actual Greek word. It's called harpazo, okay? It means to catch away, to snatch by force. You see something coming and boom, pulls it out of the way quickly. I always remember that with, um, I believe it was Perry Stone that talked about it years ago, that he was speaking to a Greek brother in one of his travels. And he had said, you know, what, what's the definition for the word harpazo? Can you define it for me? And he says, well, if there was like a little girl and the little girl was out in the streets, you know, she got her ponytail on and you see a car come whipping down the street from around the corner and you reach out and you just grab her by the ponytail and you rip her out of the road to save her. He says, that's a harpazo. It's a drastic pulling out of the way by force. That's the rapture. That is the harpazo. And pretty cool, isn't it? That the harpazo date this year, July 26th, is the event for us on this side of the year, uh, on this side of the world. I thought that was pretty cool. All right. So that was a, a fun little side one. Let me show you another one. This one is awesome as well. But this one, you have to have been here at least for a little while to understand um, uh, that, and, and we'll touch on it a little bit here today, but to understand the, the revelation of the fractal. And we're going to touch on it just a little bit, but this revelation of the fractal is how you're going to understand this. You see, Adam lived, okay? Who do we know Adam represents, guys? Adam represents the flesh. Well, if you remember the creation stories, you have the spirit portion, the light portion, and the flesh portion, right? Adam was created at the 7,000 that began the flesh. Hello, right? That's the, that's the group we're living in right now. This is why the Jews are the chosen people. The Jews are his people. That's why we're to pray for them. We're to uplift them because we're living in their portion of time. It's the flesh. It's theirs. That's why the millennial reign is their promised peace millennial reign. Why? Because we're in their portion of 7,000. But there are spirit portions here. There are light portions here. It's the pre, it's the mid, and it's the post. And we've revealed all of these things. So we've taught, and you guys understand, that Adam represents the third seven, right? Just like this did. Just like this did. Okay? Oh, wrong one. Just like this did. You had the first seven, like creation. Okay? They, these are the mystery ones, as we all know. These are the ones that are the mystery. It would have been that creation story, that gap theory of Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. It really played out like seven days to the, to the Lord. Or would have been, if we were there watching, it would have been like 7,000 years if we were in the dimension of time. Because the Lord was so excited to go out and to start to create and create that spirit realm and everything else, he was so excited it flew by, like Jacob's story, it flew by like days. Then you had the light portion. You had the creation of light, and the creation of light was what? Seven days. Seven days. When Jesus comes as the Son of Man for 40 days, what is he coming to do? He's coming to bring light to those who sit in darkness. He's coming for the mark group, the lost sheep of the house of Israel to which the Gentiles are grafted in, right? The sleepy church. Those seven days were to the Lord like seven days. But if we were there in the physical and looking in the dimension of time, it would have been like 7,000 years. And then we got from Adam. You see, this is Adam. And Adam had 7,000 years. The flesh portion is Judah, and it's 7,000 years. We're living in their portion. There are spirit people. There are light people. Maybe even they have both, right? Because we're all living in the dimension of flesh. Hello. Adam represented the flesh in the beginning of flesh. So what do we know about this? Check this out. 
Wouldn't it be fitting if Adam's time, Judah's time ended and then there was a thousand years of their flesh portion? How old did Adam live? 930 years old. Guys, remember this? Adam is the flesh. Adam's portion is represented in the end of days of the 7,000 as the seven years. Do you see why the whole world is caught up in seven years of tribulation? That the whole earth from creation is only 7,000 years? Because their entire perspective is founded in the Gospel of Matthew. Not their fault. They just never fully understood the Gospels of Mark and Luke and the purpose of the mysteries that are hidden within them. It's beautiful. It's incredible. So what happens? If this represents the flesh portion, and this is Matthew's represented as Jews, represented as the Adam portion that began the flesh almost 7,000 years ago, almost 6,000 years ago. What do you see? Seven, like 7,000? And then what does it start? What is the Jubilee the beginning of? The millennial reign. So when these seven are done, it's the end of six, and then it's a thousand years. Well, guess what? What happens at the end of 14 years? Hello. What is the end of 14 years? It's the end of 70 for who? For Judah, for Jerusalem. You see, we have the other 70 of when they came into the land. We have it understood. We have it counted from Leviticus. And when they captured the rest of Jerusalem in 67, and you count 70 years, what do you get? The end of 14 years is 70 years complete. You see, that's, the, that's part of the revelation from the Jeremiah video, last video. So how old was Adam? Adam just so happened to live 930 years. Judah, when the 14 years are over for them, which is when their seven years of trumpets, which is their portion as seven years as the 7,000 since Adam are over, what is it? It's the end of 70 for them. And Adam was what? 930? 930 plus 70? is what? 1,000. Do you know what this is the end of? 6,000 years. Then what starts? The 7,000th year. 930 plus 70 for Judah, the flesh portion, 70 ends, the thousand years begins, and the one who started it lived 930 when their portion is done after 70 years is complete. It's a thousand years. See how cool that was? Just a little interesting side note, wouldn't you say? Had to share it. Thanks, Roy. That was a good one. All right. Let's keep going. Now I'm going to close some of these out. Okay, so like we said with the Harpazzo, right? This was one where it all started in relation to the 14 years. You see, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. Okay, let's go to it in our trusted eSword. eSword, guys, if you don't have it or something like it, you should get it. Because eSword, look at this, you get all the word definitions, all to their roots and everything. Without having a Strong's Concordance at your fingertips, you're falling behind 10 times. You're, you're way behind the pack. This is going to explode your understanding. Okay. And I think in many applications, it's free or just like a few bucks a year, okay? So this was where the revelation of 14 years started for me. I had read this because people always look in the is. They look at what Paul was saying in the beginning and they say, oh, see, well, this is Paul. He's talking about a period of time when he was there. Yes, but there is prophecy. What so many people don't understand is the prophetic isn't just in the prophets and the Psalms and in creation. It's in the Gospels, it's in the New Testament throughout, it's the epistles, it's everywhere. 
It's not just the book of Revelation and the discourses. It is all throughout. He's talking to the Jews here as if he's now at the coming after 14 years and change. And he starts by saying, I knew a man in Christ. The only ones who are in Christ are the pre-trib group Holy Spirit filled. Like that creation portion. You see, that creation portion are those that are what? In verse 2 of Genesis 1, says, and the Spirit of God was over the waters. That was the spirit portion. That was the beginning of that first creation. So what does he say? I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. You see that? Above 14 years ago. Okay? You're going to see how it's connected to this one too. So you've got above 14 years ago. And it says, whether in the body or the body, I cannot tell. And it says, such is one. So that means like. So it's not like the rapture of the great multitude that everybody expects, whatever that might look like. This one is going to look different. And it says what? Was caught up. There's our harpazo word. G726. Kind of fitting, isn't it? Where do they go? The first group is going to the third heaven. And then we had one of our sisters that brought the uh, apocrypha book to us. And I think it was from uh, uh, the fifth fragment from the church fathers. And it says the first group would go to heaven, the second group would go to paradise, and the third group would inherit the city. Well, how about that? That's exactly what Second Chronicles chapter 12 is all about. Then what does it say? I knew such a man. So see, not in Christ, but kind of, you know, look, like, there's that like. So this one's in Christ, like a rapture. This one's kind of like the first man. And this one isn't like a rapture. This one is the rapture. This one is the second one, the great multitude marks group that goes mid-trib in the seventh year of seals and they go to paradise. You know why they go to paradise? Because that's what the Lord's coming with. You see how it ties in? That's why that revelation, May 11th, 2018, was such a massive deal. It was the evidence of the Lord coming at the end of the first six years of seals, like Daniel 7, on heavenly Mount Zion, where he would gather them. And this is exactly what we read and we've shared many times in Second Ezra. See, but he shall stand on Mount Zion and Zion shall come to be made manifest to all people prepared and built as you saw the mountain carved without hands. Well, that's pretty wild, isn't it? Because there is no Christian in a seven-year belief that will tell you the Lord's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. They'll tell you he's coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. Problem, isn't there? You can't reconcile that. It's impossible to reconcile in seven years. So then, then what do you get? We go down further. And of course, it says, you know, it talks about other parts. But remember, he's talking to them after coming a little bit more than 14 years later. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 14, he says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not lay up for their parents, but the parents for the children. Okay? They had to lay up for all of us that went before, in the pre-trib and the mid-trib. Why did they have to do it? Why did they have to do it? You remember? Do you remember why? We're living in their time. We're living in their portion of flesh. We're living in their 7,000 years. They're the chosen people of the flesh. They're the ones that had to endure. We're living in their portion. There's light and there's spirit that went before it. That's why that, that's why that fractal video is going to blow your mind once you understand some of those other videos that came before it. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So what is this third time? You see, if it's 14 years and a bit, then it's at the end of what? It's at the end of the 14 years of tribulation. Well, how about that? You have that bit above 14 years. There's your 14 years. But wait a second, Alan. You said the Lord's coming at the end of the 13th, and he's going to fulfill the 14th. 
Yes, he is. So do you know who he's going to? Do you know who he's talking to? Who is he talking to when he now says, this is the third time I'm coming to you? I will not be burdensome to you. See, he's no longer going to be burdensome to them or anything. So who's he talking to? Well, if you remember, about three and a half years, the Lord's here, right? After coming at the end of the sixth seal, he's here, fulfills the seventh year. And then the rebuilding of the city and streets happens for about the first three and a half years. Then you've got Satan who's cast down at about mid trumpets. The pit is open. You'll have Satan, false prophet is, ba uh, is there. Antichrist is brought back because Antichrist is killed at the end of the sixth seal. And when the pit is open, he's brought back. Satan's going to have what? Satan and those guys are going to have two and a half years. It's the revelation, remember, of Daniel chapter 12, time times and a half. So it's one, two and a half. Where as Revelation chapter 12, 14 says that that group, that those who were in Jerusalem with the Lord, they're now going to fly away for time and times and a half. That's one plus two plus a half. That's three and a half years. So if two and a half years ends here and the Lord comes, defeats them, and all the battles that take place in the, in the 14th year, how long were they gone for? How long did they fly away on the wings of eagles for? They don't come back at the end of the two and a half years. They're protected in the wilderness place until the end of the 14th year. Lo and behold, there he is. I'm not coming to be burdensome to you, nothing. I'm not bringing any more destruction. Nothing's coming against you. And how did he start the conversation? I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. So what was the word for above? You'll remember how this all started to, to play out. These, these are revelations back from the beginning. And then how these things have developed. How did we come to understand this piece of above? For the longest time, I knew, obviously, when I first came across this, that above had to be less than 15 years. Otherwise, this would have said 15 years ago or above 15 years ago. So it had to obviously be more than 14, but less than 15. Then the revelation had to come, right? Then more and more and more came to be revealed from it. Of course, the discourses, having understood the gospels, and the discourses start to reveal themselves. And what did we come to know from Luke's discourse? 21 verse 10. Then said he unto them, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Okay? Great earthquakes, fearful sights, great signs shall there be from heaven. But then verse 12 says, but before. Okay? But before. So look at this. Here, if we go back, we get that word. Where is it? Okay? In front of, prior to, before. Okay, the word 4253, this was the word from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago. So in front of, prior to. So what does it say? Luke 21, 12, but before, same word. But before all these, what's he talking about? These things here. What do we come to understand? What is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom? It's the red horse rider. It's when the great sword will be given. And they'll start, Jerusalem will be destroyed. At the end of the 50th day, Jerusalem is attacked and World War III begins. You see, th this was something that after studying um, Second Ezra for a long time was mind-blowing as well because we saw starting in verse 29, behold, the days are coming when the Most High will deliver those who are on the earth. See, deliver. Who's the deliverer? Messiah, right? That also became part of the revelation. So Messiah is the deliverer. And then we saw that then bewilderment of mind shall come over those who dwell on the earth. So there's a deliverance of those who are on the earth, the pre-trib group, the, the spirit portion, those in Christ above 14 years ago. Then the world is going to be bewildered. Luke 21, 34. Starts with, you know, don't be caught uh, unawares, right? The whole world is going to end up being caught unawares. They're going to be bewildered. 
for all those that dwell on the earth. And then what does it say? And they shall plan to make war against one another, city against city, nation against nation. This is the exact same thing, and it's the red horse rider. So when we read this in Luke 21, but before all these, that means whatever this conversation is, it's before the red horse rider, and it's the portion that 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 2 said was, but first. It was awesome stuff, guys. Awesome, awesome things. You remember, if you go into Mark's discourse, okay, then we followed this into Mark's discourse, and what did we find in Mark's discourse? There's no such wording to separate it. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. See, not then he said unto them. So famines and troubles, these are the beginnings of sorrows, but take heed to yourselves lest they deliver you up to councils and synagogues. And You see? So when is it officially going to begin for these guys? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. When does nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom start? At the 14 years. At the 14 years. It was right there in Ezra's. It's right there in Luke's discourse. It's right there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <laughs> Excuse me. Chapter 12. What do we get in Matthew's discourse? Matthew's discourse, we ended up with the same thing. There is no division of word. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes. These are the beginnings of sorrows. They're going to deliver you up to all nations. This is the same as Mark's. It's going to start in Jerusalem. It's going to spread. It's going to be across the world. And the Jews are going to be scattered for seven years while the world is persecuted and the Christian persecution really begins. The Jews are being persecuted too, but they're already, they're in one place essentially, right? In Israel. And that's why it's going to be destroyed and scattered. You see, there's no temple coming first. And that's the difference. That's, that's one of the biggest deals that, that people get confused with because they think the temple is going to be built first. What they don't realize is for their disobedience, the land must rest for seven years before the temple can be built. And there ain't no Antichrist building the temple. It's not how it works. You see, it's misunderstanding because everybody learned from Matthew. What about this one? In Luke chapter 17. So we know that Luke's portion is before nation against nation. We know it's part of the above portion. And what happens when we go to uh, Luke chapter 17? He tells us, starting in 24, it's going to be as lightning from one end to the other when he comes in his day. And then in verse 25, it says, But first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation? This is prophetic. Remember what they're asking him about. They're asking about the coming of the kingdom. That's what they're asking about. So when he says, but first must he suffer many things, that means there's a period of time where he's here for a bit. You see, this generation didn't mean that generation. They're talking about the final, the final generation, the one we're in right now. Okay, he's saying what his days will be like when he, or when he comes in his day. And this one says, in the days of the Son of Man. And he goes on to give us the story of Noah in relation to the 40 days. So again, we've understood this. It, it was piece by piece by piece. And we understood and it built and it got more clear and it became part of our common end time vocabulary that we've been teaching for so long. You see, in Genesis 1, in the, the spirit, the light, the flesh, I said we were still going to get back to it, right? So watch this. If we go back into Genesis 1, you see, what do we have? We saw 2 Corinthians. There was a, an above 14 years, right? And above 14 years. And then there was seven as days, seven as thousands, right? In the creation. One was the first one, which was this above reference as 2 Corinthians, is what's called gap theory, 
where they believed that there was a creation between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 before Genesis 3 start, uh, Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2, before verse 3 started. We have the revelation of it. You see, it, it's the exact same story as this. It was seven days or 7,000 years if we were in the dimension of time watching it. But he was so excited, it's a period of above 14, which flew by like days. It's an incredible thing. And, and what is it? The Spirit. Those who have what? The Spirit of God. Who are the ones that have the Spirit of God? You guys all know it, but I'm going to go to it anyways. Romans chapter 8. Right? Those who are in the flesh, but you're not living by the flesh. You're living by the Spirit. You see, we're living in the flesh, but we're spirit. This is the creation. This is Genesis 1, the spirit group, but we're living in Judah's time, right? In the Jews' portion of flesh. And what does it tell us about it in verse 14 of Romans 8? For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God, right? Co-heirs with Christ. Hello. It's such an incredible revelation, man. If you get the chance after you watch those other videos, if you're new, you really want to check that out. It will blow your mind. Okay? This is that spirit portion. In verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Who is this light? Of course, it's Jesus. Okay? It's Jesus. And when we went to John, this is what, this is what clinched it for us was John chapter 1 said, in the beginning was the Word, okay? Jesus was the Word. Jesus was in the beginning. It was the Spirit portion. And then what does it say? In John 1 verse 7, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light. Because what? Jesus came for light. Jesus came as the light of the world, right? And what did Jesus tell everybody? I am not come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Ha uh ha. -huh. You see? What's the typology of this time? He, he's not coming for the spirit portion. That spirit portion is going to be removed. And then he's coming for 40 days to shed his light, to release his light as well within the disciple workers so that that light can go and be spread among his group that he created in the day's portion of creation. It was all about light in the seven days of creation. You see? And then what happened? Then you get to John 1 verse 14, and the word or the light was made flesh. Well, how crazy is that, right? It's the story of Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, right? And the word made the spirit, right? The spirit portion those that are part of the Spirit, then he was made light. And this was all the seven days of creation and the creation of people that were made, this not people, quote unquote, but those that were made in his image, which was light. We came to Genesis 2. And after the seventh day, then was the creation of Adam, the flesh. The flesh was then started. We're living in those 7,000 of flesh. And if you remember, the other piece of this revelation came from 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. I always say that's such a, uh, such a, whoa, pay attention, right? He's really getting your attention by saying, don't be ignorant of this one thing. That one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Okay, so that meant in those creation of days from Genesis 1 verse 3, when it was day one with light, and then day two, day three, until Revelation, uh, until um, Genesis chapter 2 verse 1, the seventh day, he's telling you that one day is with the Lord. Okay, they were with the Lord. One day was like a thousand years. Hello. Remember I told you? They might have been days because they were with the Lord, 
But if we were there in the dimension of time, it would have been thousands. And then he says, comma, and. So this is separate. They're added together, but they're separate. And then it says, comma, and a thousand years. Well, that started from Adam. The flesh is as one day, which means to the Lord, it was seven days of creation. And in the thousands we're in, it's seven, it's seven days as well. But it also means for us that in the seven days of creation in Genesis 1 to the beginning of 2, to the Lord it was at seven days, but to us in the dimension of time, if we were there looking, it would have been like 7,000. And then we are in the 7,000 since the flesh. What is this about? The 14,000 of creation from beginning to end, from the light to the end, or the 14 days to the Father. What is the revelation of the end of days? You got it. 14 years. Told you it's everywhere. Goes all the way back to the story of creation. And what was that little piece of the gap theory creation? It was the first seven, the mystery seven days, the mystery 7,000 that came first but that flew by like days because he was so excited. Spirit, light, flesh. It's crazy how these things have come about. You see, when you're reminded of these things and you study and you look into these things and you seek them and search them out for yourselves and you go watch the videos and the studies of these things for yourself, it's going to blow your mind. And then what happened? What did we get from Genesis chapter 1 after all of this revelation? That, that um, fractal and that entire revelation of creation um, was about a year and a half ago. It's still one of my favorite ones. It's, it's one of my all-time favorites. I've got a lot of good ones, and nothing will trump the Gospels and the revelation of the 14 years. But this one is a close, you know, uh, third or top five easy. Because it's, I'd say even third. It, it's that incredible. Because you have to remember that all of these things that continue to be revealed from it, it, it was over the top. And it didn't begin with the revelation of this fractal all the way from the beginning. It started from another video three years ago uh, this past March. You see, look at what this says the beginning God created, okay? What people forget is what the word beginning means. This word beginning means Jesus. You see, when you don't have a strong concordance at your fingertips, they just think it means it's the start of things and God created it and God is Jesus. Well, God is Jesus. Jesus did create everything, but it was the Father God who gave it all to him to create. It even tells us in Romans, this is the answer to it. You see, in the beginning, God created. So who's the beginning? Jesus. Who's the beginning? The feast of first fruits. What is the feast of first fruits? Okay. What, what is the feast of first fruits? The feast of first fruits is resurrection day. Leviticus, 13, uh, um, Leviticus 23, right? The wave of the sheaf offering. Resurrection day. Which means that in the beginning, God created. So in Jesus, God created. We all know that Jesus created it all. It's all here in Genesis 1. But the Father gave it to him to create. Hello. So Jesus is the beginning, and the word for beginning who represents Jesus is the feast of first fruits, which is the what? The bread without leaven. Jesus is the only one without sin. He's the only one to never have sin. He is the one with no leaven. Hence, resurrection day, right? So what else do we know about this? We also know that the beginning of creation was in Taurus. You see, 
the early Hebrew to the early Hebrews, I've shared this so many times, right? To the early Hebrews, Tor Taurus was the first constellation in their zodiac and consequently represented the first letter of their alphabet. Well, isn't that amazing? Because the Hebrew alphabet is what? 22 letters. What is the story of creation from in the beginning? Turns out it was seven that flew by like days, right? The gap theory creation. Seven of days that are like 7,000 if we were there that play out as seven years of seals. And then you have the flesh portion, 7,000 as seven days as seven years. And then what is it? When Adam's people portion is over, the 7,000 are over and the millennial reign begins for the final 21 in the big picture, 21,000th year. And when it's over, it's the new beginning of the eighth day of tabernacles is another picture of it. And the eighth day is the 22nd. So it could be in the big picture, it's 22. In the end time picture, it's 15. And in the trumpets picture, the flesh portion, it's eight. It's all the same story. Mind-blowing stuff, guys. So in the beginning, just like we know their alphabet is 22, the revelation of the end of days is 22 years, the whole story of creation is 22,000. And in the beginning, it was Taurus. Okay? This was the 16th day in Taurus. This became hugely, hugely important for us. Remember that? Even with Moses, okay? In Exodus chapter 12, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. Do you think, as I've said a number of times recently, that if Moses was here and he was looking up, at the sun, moon, and stars to determine his months. And we were back in, what, March, April. And Passover was in April because the sun has gone off course. Do you think if Moses was here and he looked up, he would have said, yeah, that's Nisan, or that's the first month? No. 100% no. If Moses was here and Aaron were here, and they looked up at the sun, moon, and stars, they would not have told you that this was Passover time. Because when the Lord told that to Moses, he told them when it was in Taurus. And this is why I was telling you the Hebrew calendar is correct because what happens is every Savan month is always in Taurus. Every single year on the Hebrew calendar, Taurus is always Savan. Let me show you this. Here's so the time with Moses was around 1440 BC. Okay? So in 1440 BC, Nisan 1 or sorry, uh, Nisan, the first month. There's your 14th, 15th, 16th of Nisan. Here's the equivalent over here. 27th, 28th, 29th, okay, of April. May doesn't start till right here, okay? So April, that's why April is here. See, there's April, and it continues down to right here. This is May, and then it continues down. So April 27th, through the 29th was the 14th, 15th, 16th, okay? Which equivalent was Nisan first month, 14th, 15th, 16th. So let's go have a look, since my computer's going crazy, because I have Stellarium open as well. Let's have a look at where the sun and the moon were. April 14th, okay? 1440 BC, okay? April, there's April 14th. Okay, April 14th, according to this, was Nisan 1. 
April 14th. Let's see. 1440 BC, April 14th. What do you have? The sun in Taurus and there's the beginning of the moon. You have the moon starting day one. Watch this. Let's go forward. We'll go till we get to full moon. Okay? Full moon. Whoops. Oh, I got to come back. I lost the moon. I clicked on something else. Okay, let me click on the moon. Let me go back. Let's go to full moon. And full moon, you can't really see it down here, but let me show you. So there's the moon illumination, 99.9. .9, okay? You're not always going to get a perfect 100. And look at what the date is. April 27th, 99.9, .9, full moon. So let's go look at the chart. April 27th. There it is. And again, it goes to evening to evening. So it would have been the 14th into the 15th. So the 27th, it starts, right? 27th into the 28th. Full moon. When was it? April 27th into the 28th. Nissan, 14th into the 15th. Proving what? The year started in Taurus. So let's keep going. Let, let's go see what month two is. Oh, here it comes. May 13th, May 14th, they would have seen it. There's the sun, there's the moon. And let's see, May 14th, you see, month one, IR1. Now check this out. Remember this imagery, okay? There's your month of IR starting, just like we just started now, right? Let's go back to Taurus. Okay, let's go back to Taurus and let's go to 2023. 2023. Uh, where are we going? Okay. Oops, too far. Okay, 2023. Here it comes. There's the sun in Taurus in the same spot. There's the moon. We have it on May 20th. Remember what I said, it can be off by a day or so because they preset the calendars. So they got about May 20th. Uh, there you go, okay? May 20th into the first of Savant. There's your beginning of Taurus. Now watch this. We can go to full moon date. It is right around there. Right, the third going into the fourth. And what do we see? It was June 3rd going into the fourth. There's your full moon in Taurus. Why, why does this matter? Well, let's see if we can track what Moses was looking at. That's what a lot of people had asked me about. What about what Moses was looking at? Can we see it, what it was like when Moses was looking at it? Well, let's keep going. Let's see when the moon is coming around again. Huh. Look familiar? Does this look familiar to you? It's the exact same positions we had in 1440 BC when the Lord was sharing that with Moses. This is the beginning of your months and this is the beginning of your years, which was in Taurus. And now there's month two starting. We no longer call it month two or IR. It would be the fourth month now because the sun has gone off by two. But you see, guys, do you remember this? I know you do. This is an apocryphal book, but this is a big deal for us. This is why I'm sharing you these things. Whoever finds the beginning, whoever, listen to what it says. It's the Gospel of Thomas, an apocryphal book, verse 18. The disciples said to Jesus, tell us how our end will be. Jesus said, have you discovered then the beginning that you look for the end? You see, if you want to even know where the end is, you're going to first have to look to the beginning to begin to even understand where the end is. For where the beginning is, there will the end be. Blessed is he who will take his place in the beginning. 
he will know the end and will not experience death. Hello. Isn't it good? Doesn't it feel awesome to know that you're part in the understanding of knowing the beginning? Is this necessary? Do you have to know all of this to be a part of the pre-trib escape? No. But for those who are diligently seeking the Lord, the reward is coming. The reward is coming. This is the beginning. It was the 16th day in Taurus. The Lord told them, in Taurus, this is the beginning of your months. It's playing out precisely like it did in the sun, moon, and stars in Exodus chapter 12, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. And just as Thomas said, or as Jesus said to the disciples in, in the Gospel of Thomas. Don't you think it's important that, that time and understanding to figure this out is, is key? So what is this beginning? Well, if we've just established Savan, and we've just established Taurus, and we found the beginning to understand the end, and we've been trying to discern how the Lord is counting it from the beginning to the end, wouldn't it make sense that if in the beginning it was the 16th day in Taurus, that the beginning would be the 16th day in Taurus? Because whoever finds the beginning finds the end and will not taste of death. Isn't that what all this is about, brothers and sisters? Well, it's way beyond it with everything that we've revealed. But if we go to Luke chapter 21, right? Isn't this part of what it's about? Starting in verse 34, and take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon you unawares. You see, that's what's going to do the whole world, just like 2nd Ezra said. For as a snare shall it come upon all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. The entire earth is going to be caught off guard. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. What on earth do you think that means, being accounted worthy to escape everything? The answer is found in the end of the verse. And to stand before the Son of Man. And to stand before the Son of Man. Where do we get that? Lo and behold. The transfiguration stories, right? What does it say starting uh, uh, in verse 27? But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. So they're going to be standing in the kingdom of God in the third heaven, like Second uh, uh, Corinthians was saying, those above 14 years. And then look at what we get. Came to pass about in eight days. You see how it always gets weaved together? Beginning of Genesis to the end of Revelation, we can weave this all day long, day after day, hour after hour. and will not experience death. <clears throat> so don't you think that if we have truly understood the revelation finally of the 70th year, and we've been able to, to break it down, pin it down, show it all over the place in the entirety of this revelation, that, that these little parts and pieces over the years that just weren't quite clicking there was still a little something here and a little something there that in the year when we finally get the revelation 
of the end of 70 years connected to 289, which led us to Luke chapter 13, which then a brother led us to Leviticus 19, which gave us the revelation on how to count when they came into the land. And then this year, we find out after putting this together and having the final pieces, because we'd been building on this for, I think, close to three years, two and a half years, something like that. And finally, all the pieces clicked, all the parts and pieces are in place. And we realize that from 70 to 70 is 14 years. It's craziness. Counting this was when they came into the land, for which they did have part of Jerusalem. They did have the Negev, which is the southern plain in Jerusalem. And then they captured Jerusalem in 67, the rest of Jerusalem. So we end up with a 70 that ends it, which really starts it. You see? It's a 70 that ends it, yet a 70 that starts it. And yet, another 70 comes to an end and brings it all to an end. Never again in all of human history will this happen. Never. And how much more clear does the revelation of 14 years have to be? And these numbers took us all the way back in the Sabbath counts, all the way back to the birth of Christ, to when he began to be 30, which means he just completed his 29th year and was somewhere a little bit after having completed 29, he was now at some point early in his 30th year, which we know was the revelation of the one year before John was crucified. We're going to touch on this more. Because, you see, I had been teaching that for years, over three, four years now. The revelation that we can prove, and we've been teaching it for a long time, that John the Baptist was still around for about two months from when Jesus showed up. Okay, we talked about it from John before. We're going to go there in a little bit. And we showed, um, uh, which I'm going to show you again, that John was in prison for about 10 months. So even though Jesus began his ministry after John was in prison, the official, when everybody turned to him, was not until John was beheaded. It wasn't until John was killed that all those who were still going to visit him in prison and still seeking and bringing messages about Jesus and back and forth, they didn't all turn finally only to Jesus until John was gone. And it is at that point that Jesus then began his about three and a half years of ministry. But there was a whole year that came first. And we were able to reveal it in the Shemitah year counts from the beginning of Jesus' birth all the way to the end of the 14 years. Could you imagine that? It was the end of days revelation of the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. You see, again, see how it all weaves together? I'm taking you all the way back to that story of the revelation of the Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion. It's at the end of the sixth seal. So then what happens during that seventh year of seals? The 144,000 are sealed. The great multitude rapture happens. The seventh seal happens. The Lord makes a covenant. You see, then you've got the seven years of trumpets that start. But there was that seventh year of seals first. And it was that revelation of the seventh year of seals in the end of days that brought me to look back and to consider what happened in the time with Christ when John was here. Because everybody's been twisted on trying to say, well, you know, just because the world says three and a half years, Believe me, like everything else in Christmas time and everything else in seven years and only going to Matthew, we know it's all messed up and twisted. There's so many things that haven't been understood. And churchianity, you know, for the most part, just trying to to bring the people and and teach them how to live as Christ 
and being loved and and to love others and and to be repentant and to accept Christ that's their job you want to go to the deeper things that's our job to go in and to seek these things deeper to diligently seek him and these are the rewards we're getting and so as i went in to look at that and realized that jesus and john were still around for about two months together before john went to prison and then there was 10 months I, that was another one of those things where I just about lost it. I was like, what? The revelation of the end of days was what proved what happened in the is. And for those that don't know, the was is Old Testament to Christ. The is is from Christ until the pre-trib escape. From the pre-trib escape to the end is the is to come. Was, is, is to come. So it's the is to come revelation that revealed the understanding of what happened in the is. There was one year before his official, quote unquote, about three and a half years of ministry started. And the Shemitah count revelation proved it. It proved it. It didn't even skip a beat. It's all perfectly in order, even to the understood time of his death and resurrection in 33 AD. Even to the star of Bethlehem in the 1 BC, they'll say 2 BC because they don't have the year zero, right? But 1 BC, 2 BC, you're supposed to have a year zero, so really it's 1 BC, okay? So all of it from the star of Bethlehem to Luke chapter three, when he began to be about 30, which means it was shortly after he completed 29th birthday, which showed the one year, which was two and then 10 months with John in prison. And then you had the about three and a half years of his ministry, which concluded at Passover in 33 AD. All of it in order, counted all the way up, brought us to when they came into the land. Revealed Leviticus, counted and understood in order, and it even started a new Shemitah cycle. When the official count began for them in 1953. You see, the only issue that's been going on with this count is which house? Okay, you have the house of Israel, you have the house of Judah. And then you have the Lord God. Okay? Then you have the Lord God. To the Lord God, this is the beginning. Hello. Do you think just because the clocks, as we've said before, just because the hours and the minutes go around on a clock, that one o'clock position, the one, two, three to through 12, do you think they all move just because the, the hands move? No. So why would we think that Moses and what the Lord told him, what the Father told him, why would it change? You see? Well, it, it changes because the feasts are over there, right? But what if we go to the end of the barley instead of the beginning? What if we go to the beginning of the harvest of the wheat? And we start to track that instead. What if we go to what we were told and what was revealed to us before that piece of Apocrypha was found and we go back to the beginning? And then we do the beginning from, guess what? Just so happens that was Jesus' birthday. Just so happens that was the beginning of creation. Funny how that works, right? And this is what the Father calls the beginning. You see, to the father, this is the beginning. To the house of Israel, Nisan is the beginning. And to the house of Judah, as you guys know who have been around for a while, to the house of Judah, Tishri is the beginning. Do you see why they have their month and year here at Tishri 1? It'll start 5784 on Tishri 1 this year. Why would they have that there? Why doesn't... 
if, if if it's if it's Nissan, why don't they call fifty seven eighty four all the way back in Nissan? Because this is Judah. The house of Judah counts from here. That's why it's done like that. Right? We'll we'll come back to some of these things in a moment. We're going to keep going, build more, build more, see it and understand it. You see, here's another piece now. I was watching a video. This was back in, again, it was in 2018. It was about April. And it was, um, I've shared it a, a bit in the past as well, and especially back then. I was watching a video uh, by Tim Foster. I think that's how you say his last name. And he was talking about, how um, he was talking about the book of Zechariah and he was mentioning about the book of Hosea. He was saying how Zechariah was written to the Jews and how Hosea was written to the Gentiles. And so all you have to do is just spend a little time searching and it's not hard to see that Hosea is written to the Gentiles, right? Come to Romans chapter 9, starting verse 24. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he saith also in Osi. Who's Osi? Hosea. Hosea. I will, uh, in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. And it shall come to pass that in that place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Well, when he mentioned that, and I saw that Zechariah had 14 chapters in it, and all of this revelation for the past six months or so was the Gospels and this revelation of the 14 years, I went through every book of the Bible and look to see how many how many gospels or how many books had 14 chapters. It turns out there was one for the Gentiles, right? You can say Gentiles, right? House of Israel mixed in there, right? Because they're grafted in. And then another one for the Jews. Two books in the entire Bible have 14 chapters. One is to Judah. One is to the Gentiles. Huh. What were the chances of that? So, of course, I started digging into them and I started just going wild. I was, it was another one of those major revelations. Did, did Tim Foster get it? No. He doesn't know the, he, he knows the difference within, within the books. Everybody that studies does. But not why there was 14 chapters. And people always like to dig and say, well, the chapters and verses were done later. And it's like the Holy Spirit couldn't have inspired them Oh, sure, the Holy Spirit inspired the writers, but he couldn't have inspired those who divided and defined the words and the chapters and the verses to help us understand, to help us better read and relate and reference. Of course, the Holy Ghost did. In fact, that's what part of this ministry does, is it absolutely proves it in the revelation of the open books. Well, if Hosea is to the Gentiles, right, and that Gentile bride, not her beloved, that's now his beloved, well, look at how it starts, right? A typology of the start of the 14 years. The beginning. <laughs> the beginning. The word of the Lord by Hosea. What's Hosea's word name mean? Deliverer. Remember that? Deliverer. When the Most High will deliver, who's going to deliver? The deliverer is going to deliver. The beginning, the word of the Lord by Hosea, the Lord said unto Hosea, deliverer, go take thee unto thee a wife of whoredoms. Okay? We've talked about this many times. It does not mean she was quote unquote a whore. It's a term used for Gentiles. We've shared this many times over the years. Okay? In the typology, in, in the understanding of the revelation of it it is that she is a gentile that is exactly what we just read in um romans chapter 9 so here it is 14 years in that time frame of the start of the 14 years bang 
Go get your Gentile bride. How crazy awesome was that when we knew it was at the time just above, right? There is no above 14 years for Zechariah. So it just starts off with it, you see? But we know it's that portion above. Well, what happened when we went to Zechariah? Zechariah was crazy awesome as well because in Zechariah, you get so much more detail. And what I mean by that is especially later in the chapters, you get an incredible amount of revelation in the end of days. Well, of course you would. I mean, why wouldn't you? Remember, we're living in Judah's portion. We're living in the Jews' portion of flesh. This, this time and this coming portion against them is going to remove them for seven years, then bring them back into the land. The rebuilding is going to take place. See, that's where we find these things in the book of Zechariah. But do you know what most people do? They skip the first seven chapters and they go to chapter eight. We'll talk about that in a moment. That's what Tim, Fo that's what Tim Foster did. Foster or Forrester, I keep forgetting. But that's what Tim Foster did. He was doing the same thing. Why do people do that? I'm going to explain to you. Because remember, in a seven-year understanding, all they see and believe and understand is that the temple's going to be rebuilt first. Well, isn't that funny when you start with seven chapters left? It starts with the rebuilding of the temple. But when you go back to the beginning of the first seven years, what does it tell you? Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these 70 years? The picture here is the 70 years. You see? These 70 years. So where's the 70 years? It's this one right here. It's this one right here. So what are we left with? Huh. 14 chapters. Funny how that works, right? Funny how that works. And yet there's a 70 ending here and there's a 70 ending here. This is what we're going to touch on a bit still more too. This is, this is part of what we were touching on or a big piece of what we were touching on in the last video. One piece says the start of 70, and then it says what will happen at the end of 70. But clearly in the, in the end of days, it's not at the start of 70 and then at the end of 70. Because we know time is compressed in the end of days. Things that played out over thousands of years, over hundreds, over decades, will play out in a picture of 14 years. Okay? This is what we've shared on many times. The, the story and the revelation of the seven churches is the best picture for it. So this is why it was such a big deal for us to find and to understand the 70th year. This was one of the key components. We're the only ministry I know of anywhere in any language that for five years plus past the 70th year of when they came in in 1948 that continued to look for it. Continued and continued and continued and continued. And you know what? I'm grateful. I am extremely grateful that the Lord, that the Spirit never led us through the Lord in the Word to the revelation of fully understanding it five years ago. Because what would every single one of you have done, or I shouldn't say every, 90 nine probably percent, maybe less, maybe less. But how many had you known in 2000, 20, in 2018, the revelation of when the true 70th year was? How many of would have just gone back to the world? Gone and done their thing and said, uh, you know, I'll watch over myself, take care of myself pretty good. Uh, share the gospel a little bit, but just go live my life until. You see, I might have even done it. If I had known it wasn't until 2023, I probably would have gone and done other things until as well. You see, the Lord knows what he's doing. He's not going to give everything all at once. That's what people forget. 
Ah, oh, you missed it. You didn't have the 70th in 2018, 19, 20, 21, 22. But it was the process of revelation. That's how it works. Nobody knows everything. But if you continue to diligently seek, greater detail of understanding gets revealed. And we have been blessed here for some reason beyond my understanding. Okay? So here we are. The 70 years. We, we've, we come to know for a long time the importance of this 70 years, didn't we? This is a huge one you guys all know very well. Psalms 90 and 10. The days of your years are three score and 10. They're 70. And if by reason of strength, they're 80. So 10 years. Yet is your strength labor and sorrow, which means travail, trouble, right? Wickedness, affliction. That's tribulation. That's 10 years of tribulation from 70 to 80. And then you have a soon cut off, a short period of time of, I believe, about six months. So you have 10 years and six months, and then you have, we fly away. That's the we fly away. We were talking about either, earlier, weaving that back in, Revelation chapter 12, verse 14, where they fly away on the wings of an eagle for the final three and a half years. What does this give you? 14 years. Told you it's everywhere. But what do we need to understand? Soon as 70 years is done. When 70 years, when the official of this count of 70 years is done, the 14 years begin. Just like everywhere else. When the 70 is done, the 14 years begin. We have the Lord God's end. We know his begins in Taurus. But the house of Israel and the house of Judah count differently. So you're going to understand why this is the end of the end possible for this year in the revelation of the 70th year. Because the house of Israel counts from Nisan. Hello. If it counted from Nisan, it would be over. You see? Look at, you go to IR1, where's IR1, see? 5783, Nissan 1, 5783. Go to Shavat. look at this. Let's go even to Shavat 5783. You see, it's 5783. Even going through Nissan, it's still 5783. That's because that's how the house of Israel did it. But who's in the land? Clearly not the house of Israel, right? For those that don't know, it's the house of Judah. Nobody knows who Israel is anymore because they've been so grafted in with the Gentiles over a couple thousand years and longer that there is no house of Israel. They're, they're grafted in with the Gentiles. They're mixed throughout the whole earth. It's the house of Judah that's in the land, okay? And that's, that's stuff that's very important for us to understand. And we're going to get to that a little bit more as well. So we've seen all these things and, and these connections to, to um, 70 years, okay? Another one we talked, see, Judah's decline. And we know from 2 Chronicles 36, verse 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate to fulfill 70 years. You see, but there, there's an issue in this count and the revelation was the last video because we know they're not going to be taken captive for 70 years again. It's a play, it, it's a squeezed, it's a condensed period of time. And when does that begin? At the end of 70. At the end of 70. Yet, like we saw in the last video with Jeremiah, what happens at the end of 70 of their captivity? It's called the grape crushing, right? It's connected to Babylon, right? Mystery Babylon, not this first Babylon that's going to be destroyed as the head of gold, but another Babylon, which is the mystery Babylon during tribulation. And when the tribulation is over, we all know it's what? The great wine press of the wrath of Almighty God. 
it's not the beginning of tribulation. So there's no way it's going to be this 70 years ending. It's going to be this 70 years ending. Okay? You'll see it more. We're, we'll bring it about some more in a bit. So what else did we get as another incredible revelation? Well, if you remember that what we were just talking about with Hosea, we had another incredible revelation that came from this right here, Numbers chapter 13. O.C., the son of noon. Okay? It starts up here. The tribe of Ephraim, O.C., the son of noon. Huh. There's our deliverer again. And the name is Hosea. Hosea in the highest. Don't get me to sing. My wife would shoot me, right? So, and he's called what? Hosea. Jesus called Hosea. O.C., right? Hosea. And he's what? The son of noon. This was the whole revelation of noon. And then Moses in Numbers 13, 16 calls Osi and changes his name from Osi, the son of noon to Yeshua. And Jesus is called Yeshua. The name is also Joshua, which is a typology of Yeshua, Jesus. Osi is Hosea, whose name is Hosanna in the highest, right? You following? The connection was to noon. And what did we reveal about noon? What was the incredible revelation about noon? Noon is the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Revealing what? 14 years? 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet? And the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet, that's noon, represents the number 50. So you had 14 years, represents then the number 50. When the 14 years are done, it represents the final jubilee. Well, isn't that interesting? There's another short period of time represented as days, as above 14 years, that comes before the 14. And then you've got the 50th year jubilee. Haven't we been talking about days as years? Amazing how that works, right? And what happened is from that video, as many of you guys know, there was that incredible video um, on uh, March 10th of 2020. And you guys know this revelation from our sister Jodell that gave me the revelation of a prayer that I had done because I was going to take down the video. I was too freaked out by it. She tells me the 50 minute mark. I was asking for the number 50 and the spirit said. She was supposed to contact me to tell me that the spirit told me and she put in quotations right on target. Now, what happened with that right on target? Well, wouldn't you know it? That was what led us to Taurus. The eye of Taurus is called Aldebaran Bullseye. It's the 14th brightest star in the sky. And it's represented as a bullseye, which means 50. You see? You see why we keep saying, I'm trying to help everybody understand. Guys, it is counted from Taurus. We've been trying to discern and to understand, and it's either on one side or the other. We've been digging and digging and searching. And now, as we're getting closer and closer and closer, the clarity gets more clear. And as the clarity becomes more and more clear, greater detailed revelations that surround it are given to us. This has been the entire process the entire time. Somebody coming in new and hearing about this now, you, you would it's hard to follow. But I just showed you Taurus was the beginning. And it wasn't me. <clears throat> right? They they actually called it the beginning. 
Their alphabet is the beginning. In the beginning, it was in Taurus in the beginning. In, in Exodus with Moses, it was the beginning. Do you think the Lord God moved because the sun moved? No, that was the barley harvest time. That was the beginning, right? The, that sheaf. But the father never moved. So if his beginning is Jesus' birthday right there, and there's the beginning, the 16th day in Taurus, just as creation, whoever finds the beginning finds the end. Do you think maybe? You think maybe in that kind of detail, maybe we're on to something? You're going to see. <clears throat> it's the only place that leads us perfectly to the final count in the 70th year. It's the only place. Here's another little fun one. Check this out. Judges chapter 15. Okay? Why is Judges chapter 15 so good? Well, you see, it's got 21 chapters. Do you know the other book that has 21 chapters? John. We show the revelation of John from, 20, from 1 to 21 in the end of days. His is a picture, so he's not part of the synoptic gospels. He stands on his own. How fitting that they've decided, however many hundreds of years ago, that he's not part of the synoptic, that he stands on his own. Because that's exactly what he does in the revelation of the end. And it just so happens the book of Judges in the Old Testament also has 21 chapters. Why did 21 matter? Hello. Seven easy, seven seals, seven trumpets. And what did it matter with Judges? What was different than John? It went in reverse. You should see I'm doing a study on Judges, and I'm going to show you some real cool things in some upcoming video um, with some of the, the events that take place, for example, in Judges 7, which would be the end of seals to the start of trumpets. It's awesome. So if we go in reverse, we go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What's the picture of the seventh right here? Right in this period of time, right? Right in here. Why is it doing that? Before the eighth begins. Okay? And look at what it says. But it came to pass within a while after the time. See? But it came to pass within a while after in the time of the wheat harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid. I used to think that was a kid because I never looked at <laughs> the Strong's Concordance that it was a goat. It was a baby goat, okay? But it's in the time of the wheat harvest that Samson visited his wife with a kid and he said, I will go into my wife into the chamber. But her father would not suffer him to go in. And her father said, I verily thought that thou hast utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to thy companion. Is not her younger sister fairer than she? Take her, I pray thee, instead. We've shared on this in the past, right? <coughs> in the chapters to years, the events happening within the, the was that reveals prophecy in the is to come. It's in the time of the wheat harvest. He's coming to visit his bride to take her in his chamber. This is the story of Leah and Rachel. He works seven years. He goes to get Rachel and he gets Leah and he's like, look, I'm coming to take my bride. What, what does Samson's name mean? Do you guys realize what Samson's name means? Sunlight. Samson's name means light. Brilliant from the east, the sun rising. Who was made light? Jesus, right? Jesus was made light. He's coming to shed his light, shine his light in the darkness. You see, Samson coming for what? He, he's coming for the one that he hated. The quote-unquote ugly one 
that they would say Leah was, right? Because Jacob didn't really want her. He wanted beautiful Rachel. But he got the older one first, which is a typology of the hated one. He wanted the more beautiful younger one. And here the father in another typology of that story says, I thought that you hated her. Clearly she's the older one because he says, look, I gave her to your friend, but look, is not her younger sister prettier than her? Take her. That's precisely what happened after the wedding, wasn't it? First seven, thinking he's getting the prettier younger one, gets the one that he didn't want. And after the wedding, after the seven days, bang, he gets the fair younger one. What time? In the time of the wheat harvest. You guys realize when the wheat harvest is, right? You see, this is another crystal clear clue for us. In the time of the wheat harvest. In, in, in which, which bride? <clears throat> the Leah one. The one he didn't really want. It doesn't mean Jesus doesn't want us, all right? But it's the one that he didn't really want. Remember, Jesus didn't come for those who are saved. They're being removed and they're part of the Spirit. Who's the friend of the Lord? Isn't the Holy Ghost a typology of the friend? Right? Jesus is coming for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His group that got corrupted in the creation of days when he made them like him as light. They're now a group of people throughout the earth living in the flesh portion, who are his lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's his younger one. That's the Leah. That's the one he really wanted. But first, he's got to get the spirit-filled ones. And the spirit-filled ones begin belong to the typology, right? The ones given to the Holy Ghost. The ones who are actually spirit-filled. What have we taught on in the story of Leah and Rachel? Winter wheat, spring wheat. You see? When is winter wheat ready? Winter wheat is harvested. And when the harvest comes in, they're to make what? Two wave loaves. Do you know that that happens in this time frame, as we've shown? For hundreds and hundreds of years, they bring in leavened loaves of bread late July, very late July, to the 1st of August. We've shown you that, didn't we? We've shown you that. Do you know that Leviticus tells us the only way to get there is seven Sabbaths, okay? There's your in the beginning. And you count seven Sabbaths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven Sabbaths. Then shall you number 50 days. There's our July 26, 726. Then shall you number 50 days. There's no way to get to that if you start from the beginning back in Nisan, but it's exactly where you get to if you count from the birth of Christ and in the beginning creation on the 16th day in Taurus. For whoever finds the beginning finds the end. For in the beginning there the end is and you will not taste of death. Seventh Sabbath, then the 50 days begin. See how important that is? It's in all of these things, guys. Right there, in the time of the wheat harvest. We've shown this. We literally just showed it for hundreds of years that this period of time right here is when they bring in leavened loaves of bread into their churches. It doesn't happen back here. 
you realize that? For hundreds of years, it never happened here. Because the harvest isn't ready yet. How, how are you going to harvest wheat when it, uh, uh, to make bread in ancient times while it's still green? Do you know, like we showed in, in the recent videos, a couple of them, that this entire time, late May into June, into July, even into early August, it's, it's winter wheat harvest time. All across throughout the middle portion, right, through all that, the middle portion throughout the U.S., throughout the Mediterranean, all of this is the time of winter wheat harvesting. Spring wheat isn't harvested till over here. Interesting, right? Interesting, when we've been talking about the differences between the two of them being winter wheat and spring wheat. And she, when he's coming for, is in the time of the wheat harvest. It's everywhere, guys. It's everywhere. Okay? Now, when we go back into Zechariah, we're going to see some things. You see, because, again, we were talking about the, the, the difference within Zechariah. Okay? In Zechariah chapter 1, we know the importance because it says these 70 years. The Lord is jealous, okay, for Zion with great jealousy. He's sore displeased at the heathen that are at ease. Get a member, there's heathen on the other side of it, but you could say the heathen that are even the Jews there as well. And what does he do? He was sore displeased and he helped forward the affliction. Bang. They're all scattered. You see? The horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. But you know what most people don't do? And this is what I was saying. Even when I saw this uh, five years ago when Tim Foster had shared uh, this piece from Zechariah, and I had realized that Zechariah and Hosea each had 14 chapters. Do you know what everybody does that I have seen talk on Zechariah? They start in Zechariah chapter 8. Why? I have no idea. Maybe because like everybody else that stopped looking to understand the 70 years, they stopped looking, so there's no way it could be connected to Zechariah chapter 1 anymore. Because what are they looking for? They're expecting the city, to, uh, uh, the, the temple to be rebuilt. Right? We all know this one. Look at what it says in Zechariah 8.9. So it says, uh, thus saith the Lord of hosts, let your hands be strong, you in these days, uh, sorry, ye that hear in these days, these words by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of, sorry, that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. Okay? It had said up here, let your hands be strong, remember? Uh, or is a little bit after. Okay? And it talks about let your hands be strong, Judah and Israel, because they're going to start rebuilding the temple. Well, when everybody only has a seven-year understanding, because they've only learned from Matthew, they're expecting the temple to be built. So isn't that so incredibly fitting that they start in Zechariah chapter 8? And do you know why they end in Zechariah chapter 14? Of course you do. Because it's when the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. Just so happens you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do you think they realize that? I don't think so. Some might, but what they don't realize is what the first seven were for. And you see what they miss when they come to Zechariah 8? It says the Lord was jealous. In chapter 1, he is jealous. In chapter 8, he's no longer jealous. This is the beginning of the first seven years of trumpets. It says, the Lord is returned unto Zion and dwell, dwell in the midst. The Lord is there while they're rebuilding. He's going to gather them in. You see, this is why the Jews, when you've got Christians all over the world, when you have seminaries putting out this teaching all over the world and believing that it's only seven years and that the temple is going to be rebuilt first, 
You have all the Jews and all the church siding together, oblivious to the fact Jerusalem's about to be destroyed, that the Jews are about to be scattered and removed for the first seven years. Because they're all looking. They're all looking to the Jews like the Jews, everything is in order. They're all good. They've prepared all the vessels. So everything's good. We're doing a good job. We know they've defiled the land. We know they're stubborn, the Lord said. They haven't turned from their wicked ways. But the whole world will come to this and will say, this is what's coming first. Okay, then where's the Lord? Where's the foundation? And look at what it says in verse 10. I'd like to see one of them explain this one. For before these days, there was no hire for man, nor hire for beast, Neither was there peace to him that went out or came in because of the affliction. For I set all men, everyone against his neighbor. Well, how about that? Isn't that exactly what we read everywhere? Then they shall plan to make war against each other, neighbor against neighbor, people against people, kingdom against kingdom, city against city. Isn't that what the red horse rider is? The sword being released? Isn't that what Mark's discourse is? says, isn't that what Luke said would happen after the above portion? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. You see? They're skipping over the things that they can't give the revelation in the understanding of to put it together. The revelation is 14 years, brothers and sisters. And in this revelation of 14 years, there's something that to the house of Judah, you see, Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, that has a connection to these 70 years in this destruction. We know when they came in 1948, and we do the count, we know this is the 70th year. We know they had Jerusalem and they did have the south of the plain. So there's another play of when 70 also comes to an end, and that's the second part and the one that happens at the end of 14 years. But this is the first one for the 14 years to play out. So as we went through this five years ago, I was harping on this all of the time for months on end. And then it was a little bit less and it was on occasion. And then it was a little bit more or less and a little bit more or less. And then it started coming back over the last year, year and a bit. Because this piece of scripture right here in Zechariah 5 through 7 is the piece of scripture that in this entirety of this revelation of 14 years, and this portion that represented above, which has been revealed, which is what I've been going through with you in this 50-day revelation, this in the beginning portion, was all about a 50-day period of time that would be above 14 years. And the fasting and the mourning of the fifth and seventh month is 50 days between them. When that first came into my realization about two or three years ago, it was a big deal again. Because we'd been looking for this above 50 and what it represented. But you see, until we got the revelation of this being in the beginning, that Taurus was the beginning. The confirmation from the Holy Ghost, the one word I got from the Holy Ghost through Jodell that was right on target, everything equaled the bull's eye. But more revelation was needed. More detail was needed. It was hard to comprehend that this is where the Lord God is counting from in the beginning. But when you accept it, and you understand it, and you understand the fractal, it's the only one 
that gives the exact count to the day of the seven Sabbaths, then 50 days, which takes you to the 50th day and the attack of the seventh month. It's the only count in all of Scripture, in all of, of Hebrew, of calendar counts. And it's the only one where it's in six different books of the Bible. We have known its importance for a long time. The problem is we needed to understand the 70th year. And when the Lord through the Spirit would finally reveal to us the 70th year, it would probably come right back and all fit together like a puzzle piece. Well, that's precisely what's happening. It's precisely what is happening. Do you remember this? You see? In fact, let me read this for you to you first. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 5 and verse 7. Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When? So you're going to see everything in, Revel in Zechariah 1 is present tense these 70 years. Everything in Zechariah 7 is all past tense, saying back then. And in the chapter to year Revelation, it's the seventh year of seals, and they're all pointing back. It's like, do you remember when you were? Do you remember when? Do you remember when? So it says, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those, everything's past tense, 70 years did you at all fast unto me. Verse 7, should you not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity? And when the cities thereof round about her, when men inhabited the south of the plain. You see, this is what we were showing in the last one. What is the south of the plain? The Negev. What is the Negev? Well, they've had it since 48. And when you do the count, you see, they also had Jerusalem in 1948. They were growing. They were in prosperity. They had planted. They had done these things. That when you do the count from Leviticus 19, they did have the Negev. They did have a portion of Jerusalem. This count of 70 is from that count of when they came into the land with Leviticus. Everything is past tense. And Zechariah 1 is the present tense of these 70 years. So why is the fifth and seventh month so important? And this is when we had, um, back then, I was talking a lot with a um, Messianic sister in Christ. And her daughter had told me that the fasting and mourning of the fifth month was the easy one, but I wasn't sure which one the seventh was. And she explained to me that it was the fast of Gedalia. And how perfect was that? Because between them was 50 days. I didn't know this at first. It took digging and digging. And when it dawned on me, and it didn't even dawn on me, like I said, right away, I ended up counting it several months down the road and realizing that there was exactly 50 days between them. And that the count that we were talking about 70 here, and it's saying the fifth and seventh month, was the same one from Second Chronicles 36 that we'd been talking about for the 70 years. And the proclamation that Cyrus makes is the same one that's being talked about in Zechariah. We go in and we do some digging and we find out that that's the story that's going on in Ezra with Cyrus. And it's the proclamation and for them to go back and rebuild. And then, as we were saying in the previous video, it was the story of what happened here in Daniel. And it was that he understood the desolations of the 70 years for Jerusalem and that the 70 weeks are the 70 weeks of years, which is related to the Father's true feast of weeks time. 
<coughs> for which know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem means they must have been attacked and destroyed. And who gave that command? This command is the one from Cyrus. So it was a was, and it's revealed in the is to come, in the prophetic. That's why it's in Daniel. That's why it's in Zechariah. That's why it's in Jeremiah. It's not just something that was, it's something that shall be as well. So as we see this, and as we understand this and break this all down, we have to ask ourselves, well, where on earth is it supposed to begin? Where, where is the 14 years? Why didn't it begin then at Nisan? Remember, this is the house of Israel. They're not the ones in the land. Well, what about the Father God counting at the beginning? Guess what? He is. This is the beginning of the count. This begins the count to the Father. And those seven Sabbaths end on the eighth of Av. And the ninth of Av begins the 50 days. Which is what? The fasting in the morning of the fifth month. What do we know happens here? What's going to happen this time? The first attack. It's not the big attack that removes them from the land. That's going to happen here. 50 days later. After the Holy Ghost anointing. You see? So, what is this then? This is going to be the beginning of the 14 years. At the second attack, 50 days later, this is when Syria, the lion, comes. When he comes from the north. That's the start of the 14 years. And it's what? The fasting in the morning of the seventh month. People will tell you, ah, no, it's not. It's the third of Tishri. Yeah, they observe it here. But that's not where the attack happened. The attack happened here. Right here. All right. We're going to talk about that. We're going to share that in a little bit. But you see, how do we know this count? We just shared it not long ago, right? There's something called a session, and there's something, okay, an accession year, and there's another thing called non accession year. Okay? Under the accession year method, this is all from scripture, guys. This is Bible chronology. Okay? Under the accession year method, if a king died in the middle of the year, the period to the end of that year would be called the accession year of the new king whose year one would begin at the new year, okay? You're going to see this is what Judah did. So if a, if a king died over here, okay, back in March, then all of this time here that the new king takes over, all of this would be called a session. And when Tishri 1 comes, they would say all of that is just his accession, his getting set up. Now we're going to begin year one right here. Okay, that's what it means. That's what the house of Judah did. And then it says, under non-accession year method, the period um, to the end of the year would be year one of the new king, and year two would begin at the start of the new year. So what was that? For the house of Israel, they would say, for example, the house of Israel, let's say, a king died in January. Then they would say from January, February, until Nisan 1, these three months or so, two to three months, they would say that is the king's first year. This is what the house of Israel did with its kings. And when Nisan 1 came, they called it the beginning of his second year. Even though he had fulfilled only one month, two months, six months, ten months, whatever, all of that was called non-accession, meaning it was part of his first year. And when Nisan 1 came, the second year began. You see? So when you have the accession year, what would the house of Judah do? They would say all of this 
was just a session, him getting set up, and we're waiting till Tishri 1. Now we're counting the beginning of year one. Do you know why that's important for us, brothers and sisters? Because of this right here. Okay? Because of this. You see? We know it's not the house of Israel that's in the land. It's the house of Judah. So the house of Judah, we know and we understood and we've done the count. So what happened was in 1948, the house of Judah got a new king, right? So in 1948, okay? In 1948, they came into the land. In 1949, they planted trees. They voted. And in March, he took office in March of 1949. But he's not the king of Israel. He is Judah. So in 1949, what would they have done in ancient times? He's the king of Judah. His first year officially began here. You following? This isn't made up. This is by biblical chronology. It's been studied. It's actually even taught in courses now, in seminaries. Maybe not all of them, but some of them. These are things studied by scholars. So what happens if you take 1949, Tishri to Tishri? 49 to 50 is one year complete. Tishri to Tishri, 50 to 51. 51 to 52. Remember three years, they couldn't touch it? According to Leviticus 19, they couldn't take from the fruit thereof. It was uncircumcised. And then from Tishri 52 to, 50, to Tishri 1953, that's the fourth year when it's holy and brought to the Lord. And then from the fifth year forward, it was theirs to eat. So from Tishri of 1953 to Tishri of 1954 was their first year. 53 to 54, Tishri to Tishri was the beginning of their first year to the end of their first year. Exactly as Leviticus chapter 49 told us. Uh, sorry, Leviticus 19 told us. Chapters 20, uh, verse 23 through 24 to verse 25. You see what the issue was, was were we counting the house of Israel? Were we counting the house of Judah? Were we counting from where the Lord God is counting from? Well, we're definitely not counting from the house of Israel. We're counting from the Father, and we're counting to the house of Judah. And when we count from the Father, when we count from the Father, from Jesus' birthday to in the beginning, from the Father's count, we get to the fifth month fasting and mourning, and the seventh month fasting and mourning, represented by the first attack and the second attack. House of Judah. You following what I'm saying, guys? You see? What is this fifth and seventh month attacks? Well, let's explore it. Remember what happens. We know from Jeremiah chapter 4. You see, just like we know from Daniel 7, it's the lion the bear, the leopard, and then the fourth beast. You see, the lion comes first. Who is the lion? The lion is Syria, those from the north. Look at this. Jeremiah chapter 4, disaster from the north. Okay? <clears throat> uh, verse 6, Jeremiah 4, verse 6. Set up the standard towards Zion. Retire, stay not. For I will bring evil from the north and great destruction. The lion is come up from his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles is on his way. Okay? What do we know happens? Verse 19. My bowels, my bowels, I am pained at my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace because thou hast heard, O my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. Destruction upon destruction is cried. 
for the whole land is spoiled suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment how long will i hear it verse 22 listen to this for my people is foolish they have not known me they are stoutish children they have none understanding they are wise to do evil but to do good they have no knowledge you see verse 26 i beheld and lo the fruitful place was a wilderness and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the lord by the fear by his fierce anger for thus saith the lord the whole land shall be desolate yet i will not make a full end right we know he's not making a full end of it because he's going to be eventually bringing them back we know the foundation is going to be laid who's the one bringing this desolation the lord is allowing it and he's empowering who the lion of the north you see this is why jeremiah with 25 we see it's like the start of the 70 right this is why it seemed a little confusing because it says in verse jeremiah 25 verse 9 behold i will send and take all the families of the north saith the lord and nebuchadnezzar the king of babylon my servant and will bring them against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against the nations round about and will utterly destroy them you see where are they coming from the north all of this is about syria coming at the beginning of quote unquote the 70 years but in the end it's not 70. it's this first seven years it's this destruction coming against it yet we do have a picture of an end of 70 years it's incredible incredible stuff to follow it and to track it <clears throat> watch this again who is this coming from the north okay second chronicles 24 watch where all this goes remember this in second chronicles 24 it says verse 23 and it came to pass at the end of the year well how about that what happens at the end of the year where was it okay what happens at the end of the year well there's tissue right that's the change of the year for judah so what happens at the end of the year what's he going to do listen to what it says that the host of syria came up against them and they came to judah and jerusalem and destroyed all the princes of the people from among the people and sent all the spoil of them to the king of damascus for the army of the syrians came with a small company of men and the lord delivered a very great host into their, into their hand because they judah because they had forsaken the lord god of their fathers from the north syria at the year's end okay what else do we have what if we go to first king so who is syria right syria there's this connection everywhere to ishmael watch this what if we go to um genesis uh chapter 16. you're gonna see all this timing i said i would talk about this again you see abraham Abraham, okay, they couldn't wait. They end up having a child. Abraham has his first son, and look what he calls him, Ishmael, okay? Calls him Ishmael. He's a wild man. And everybody's going to be against him and him against everybody, okay? He has Ishmael when he's 86 years old. Then what? You go to chapter 17, Abraham's 99 years old. How many years is that? 13 years okay when is syria going to come against jerusalem at the beginning of the 14 years okay think of like ishmael's birth and then you got what 13 years later 13 years later abraham's 86 now he's 99 years old what happens god makes a covenant with abraham and his family what happens at the end of 13 years the Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. He makes a covenant. Zechariah chapter 14. 
and he makes a covenant. He renews the covenant. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Well, then what happens? You keep reading, go down to the bottom, and you read that Abraham was 99 years old and Ishmael was 13 years old. Okay? What happens when we go to chapter 21? Yes, it's chapter 21 for a reason. Abraham is now 100 and the promise of Isaac, the typology of Christ, shows up. What happens in the 14th year? Jesus shows up, feet down on the Mount of Olives. And it's the 14th year, which is what? 86 to 100. You see? But did you notice something? Who was there at the beginning of the 14 years? Ishmael. Who was there at the end of the 13 years? Ishmael. Or at the 13 years? Ishmael. Do you realize who Ishmael represents? I just showed you in 2 Chronicles that when Syria comes from the north, the Lord God is going to deliver the Jews into their hands. They're going to lose. This is what's going to start the 14 years as the Ishmael type at the start of the 14 years. But if you remember, in 1 Kings 21, we have this other side of things, right? Well, uh, 2 Kings 21. Uh, no. Where was I? Is it 1 Kings? Yeah. We have 1 Kings chapter 20. Now look what happens. Remember this typology, the 7,000? We read in Romans that God has 7,000 reserved for the time of the end. What happens when you go to the end of the 13th year of tribulation, which is the end of the sixth trumpet? It says the 7,000 that died, right? Well, look with this. There's your 7,000 in your typology. And who's coming? 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 22, halfway through. For at the return of the year. That would be what? 13 years later at the return of the year. So it starts at the, at the, at the turn of the year, at the year's end. And it's going to end at the turn of the year, at the end of the year. Okay, watch this. Who is it again? The king of Syria. But they're saying, you see, remember, that uh, their gods are the gods of the hills. Therefore, we're going to go into the plain, right? Okay, so now Syrians, right? Syria is coming again. And they're all boastful. Now they're coming with a large army. And in verse 26, it says, And it came to pass at the return of the year that Benadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphlech to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and, all, and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. You see, this time the Syrians are now coming back with a big army and the Jews are little. Verse 28. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thine hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Hello. You see? What's the difference here? One started it, where the Jews are going to be destroyed, and one Brings it to an end. 7,000 die, right? There's your 7,000. And then what do you have? This time, Syria coming with the larger army. And they're going to be destroyed. And the Jews are going to be victorious. Syria. Syria. Ishmael, start of 13. Ishmael, end of 13. You see? Who is this Ishmael? What it, what, why is Ishmael a big deal? in this count and in this understanding, okay? Let me show you. If you remember, 
the attack, I'm trying to debate where did I want to go next, okay? So let's look, and we're going to get to Ishmael as well, okay? Watch this. What is the ninth of Av, okay? What is the ninth of Av? What are the things that have happened? Actually, you know what? Let me go into this. Oh, no, because I'm kind of getting a little bit ahead. So I'm not going to do it yet. So what you need to see here is that all of this with Syria, all of this with Ishmael, in every single case, it started the 14 years and it ended after 13. You see? So the start, you can say of 13, 13, and then what? There was that final year. Okay, like Zechariah, you've got the 13th and then the 14th chapter starts the Lord returning, feet down on the Mount of Olives. All of it related to this time right here. Now watch this. What else do we know about this 50-day count from the 9th of Av to the year's end and Tishri at the return of the year? We also know Luke, right? We know that Luke knows all things in order. We know in this revelation of Luke and all things in order, we have John's typology of his birth. And then we have to the eighth day. Again, that's that wedding. And then the Lord coming on that eighth day. That's Luke chapter nine, the not tasting of death and the Lord returning on the eighth day where it's just about the eighth year. Okay. When does the Lord come? At the typology that was connected to his birth. Okay, and this is where it got rattled for us for a little bit. Because when we did this and we understood Luke in order, chapter one, the pre-trib escape, the Lord returning on the eighth day, and the eighth day is connected to the time of his birth. Okay, we knew that it was connected to the time of his birth. And over the past several months, we had the incredible revelation of Isaiah chapter nine. Why was it so fantastic? Because it was exactly what we knew that there was going to be a light attack. Okay, it's going to be a, a, a significant attack, but it's going to be a light affliction in comparison to tribulation starting. And we have known for years. This is what the fifth and the seventh month and the revelation of it for all these years was about. We know it's going to start with a light attack. A destruction coming to two northern cities in Israel, most likely Haifa and Tel Aviv. But it would be a short-lived attack with nations in the Middle East and those two areas of Israel being destroyed. Then we have what? Jesus coming to shed his great light, you see? He's coming to shed his light on what? The lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we're told... Listen to this in verse 3. Thou hast multiplied the nation and not increased the joy. The joy before thee, according to the joy of the harvest, and as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. See? Again, connected to what? The harvest. You see? Because what happened? The joy of the harvest happened eight days earlier. Who is the light coming, guys? Remember this? For unto us a child is born. So when reading this, of course it made sense in the connection to Luke in order that it was about Jesus' birth. And we have known and we have shared this for a few years. When the escape happens, one of the things that's going to happen is there's going to be the Middle East war breakout and two cities, Haifa and Tel Aviv, will be attacked and destroyed in Israel. It will be short-lived. The Son of Man is going to show up, we believed, on his birthday. And when he comes on his birthday, this is the beginning of his 40 days, which will start on the eighth day after this short attack. This is Luke chapter 1, you know, uh, uh, the eight-day circumcision. And then you go to Luke chapter 2, and the Lord showing up in the typology of his birthday on 40 days. You see, for unto us a child is born. Why wouldn't we think it was the same connection? We knew he's coming for 40 days, and there it is after the first attack. But what? It's before verse 12, 
That then says, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. Because you see, what did it say in verse 1? In her vexation, when at the first, he lightly afflicted the land of Zebulun and of Tali. And afterward, did more grievously afflict her. And that's the one that happens after the 50 days. Again, it's Syria. It's connected to Syria. The lion, bringing them from the north. All of this, we thought, was supposed to be connected directly to his birth. Okay? Everywhere seemed to be directly connected to his birth. But, as you guys know from the last video, that incredible, incredible revelation that led us back to Matthew 4, where it said that this was fulfilled. You see? So the was was fulfilled in the is, but there's an is to come still to be played. And we see it right here. Zebulun and Naphtali. That was fulfilled by Isaiah the prophet when Jesus, see that great light, Jesus comes to shine his great light. Well, Jesus didn't do this at his birth. It said, for unto us a child is born. But it's not when he was born, clearly. Nor was it at his birthday. <clears throat> and how do we know? This is where we're going to go into this detail of this. Look at that. Right here, verse 12, Matthew 4, verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John was in, uh, was cast into prison, this is when this happened. Well, guess what? When we understand that, we can go back to something that we taught on a while ago. Years ago. In John chapter 3. You see, we know Jesus was baptized. Jesus was baptized. And then it says in John 3 verse 23, actually 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. You see, clearly 40 days had passed. Uh, they were going around. He had his, some disciples with them, and he was baptized. This period of time we've been teaching for years is about two months. Is about two months. And if you'll remember this, it says it right here. You see, they believe that he would have been in prison, that John was in prison for about 10 months. Do you get it? This, this is why these types of things are so huge in the Revelation. Because it also confirmed that one year where it was two months, then 10 months. And when the 10 months were done, then the official about three and a half years of Christ began. Which is the literal revelation of the end of days. Because the Lord is coming after the sixth year of seal. He's going to be here during the, oops, up here. He's going to be here during the seventh year of seals. Then he begins his final about three and a half years in the first half of trumpets. This is why I was telling you this is perfectly revealed in the Sabbath year count. And we've known it. We've known it for a few years. So to be able to read in Matthew 4 that it's when John is just cast into prison is when Jesus fulfilled Isaiah 9. That means this was the light affliction that comes at the beginning of the 50 days and then the typology of Jesus coming as one being born unto us who's coming to shed his light was the equivalent of him coming about two months because it was about two months at which point John was cast into prison and was in there for 10 months. 
So if we go to what we'd been looking at, which was Jesus's birth that we had been looking for all of this time, believing that that's where the count was because this is his birth. And the Lord saying, this is where I begin from in the beginning. It's easy to see that, hey, we were looking for his birth and we were looking for the beginning. But when that passed, we knew that this was still in the beginning. We knew that this was Jesus' birth. But the only thing we had left was something we had understood for years, which was a 50-day count that went from the 5th to the 7th month that was connected to the King of the North, that was connected to Ishmael, that was connected to the year's end. And then this is why it was so beautiful to receive that in the midst of the last video. Because this is Jesus' birth. And what is two months later? It's the 2nd of August this year, the 15th of Av. That's if it's exactly two months later. Why did this become a big deal for us? Because to the Lord God's count, to the Father's count, which begins here, and we count the seven Sabbaths, it's right here. And the 50 days begin right here. And this is the seventh month, 26th day for us, equals Harpazo. And then the 50 days begin. And it's the fifth month, fasting and mourning. And 50 days later, the Holy Ghost gives the anointing and they go out from Jerusalem before the attack on the first of Tishri at the year's end by Syria, by the lion, by the Ishmael type. The 40 days of the Son of Man don't begin here. The 40 days of the Son of Man begin one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days is the wedding. And the Lord returns on what? The eighth day, which is what, brothers and sisters? Two months. Two months difference. What we believed, what I believed, and we had understood from his birth that we were looking for, and the beginning of the 50 days, and all of this connection that was here, it wasn't supposed to be exactly on his birthday. That revelation from Isaiah to Matthew was the difference of the Lord coming on about an eight days, just as I was showing you guys, Luke in order, just as we were showing in the transfiguration about an eight days as the eighth day when he comes as the son of man for 40 days, just as it was to Luke's discourse, but first, but before all these, just as it was to Luke 17, but must he come and suffer many things first? It wasn't on his birthday. It was about the time of his birthday, shortly after he had turned his birthday, once John was put into prison literally about two months later. And wouldn't you know it, two months later equals the eighth day of his return as the Son of Man, the eighth day of his return from the wedding for which he will be here for 40 days till uh, somewhere in this time here, at which point Syria and those of the north will compass them about the Holy Ghost will anoint the disciples on the eighth day. And if you recall what happens, if we go to Luke chapter 24, those disciples, to only Luke's group, when he's with them for 40 days, he opens their understanding. And what does he tell them? Luke 24, 47, and that repentance and remission of sin sins should be preached in my name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are my witnesses. Behold, I send the promise of my father, Terry in Jerusalem, okay, until they get anointed, till they're endued with power from on high. It's the only one 
where they're told to start from Jerusalem. It's the only one where they're told to start from Jerusalem. Okay? Where would that 50th day anointing be? Right here. When the Son of Man leaves, he ends his 40 days. There's not many days from now, which is what Acts chapter 1 says to them, that the Lord went up after 40 days and not many days from now. Then what happens? The anointing of the Holy Ghost. Then they go out from Jerusalem, and what happens? The attack takes place on the fasting in the morning of the seventh month attack by Syria Ishmael. Are you following? Do you realize this is even in Luke 21? Remember? It's not said like Mark's discourse or Matthew's discourse. Listen to what it says. Luke 21, verse 20. And when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, see Jerusalem, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst depart out and let not them which are in the countries enter there into. For these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. See what's happening? There's a compassing about. There's a compassing about that's going to take place after the Son of Man is gone. When they see this, they're being warned. They've been warned for 40 days by the Son of Man and maybe by the disciples with them. That began on the eighth day after he has that meal with them. And there's a warning, the Son of Man's warning for 40 days. And then three days remain. The compassing about by Syria, by the Lion of the North is coming, by the Ishmael type. The anointing of the Holy Ghost will take place. And they will go out from Jerusalem. And the destruction happens at the year's end, exactly as it said it would. Watch this. Remember this with the 40 days? Remember the Muslims, right? They believe in, in one of their apocryphal writings, right? In eschatology, that they have this guy called the Dajjal coming, Al-Dajjal, okay? Ad-Dajjal. They call him the deceitful Messiah. If the Muslims call him the deceitful Messiah, who do you think he is? Are you going to side with the Muslims? For those that haven't been around for a while, listen to what it says. Dajjal is the superlative word for Dajjal, meaning lie or deception. It means deceiver, which also means in classic Syriac, this one, the compound of al-Messi al-Dajjal, with the definite article al, meaning the, refers to the deceiving Messiah, a specific end-time deceiver. The Dajjal is an evil being who will seek to impersonate the true Messiah, Jesus. Are you going to believe the Quran and, and their extra biblical books? Or are you going to believe what's been revealed here from Scripture? They believe that he's going to raise people from the dead, be able to stop the sun, produce growth of, of all sorts of things. Do you know how long they believe he's going to be here for? And when the Dajjal appears, he will stay for 40 days. Well, how about that? How about that? Don't we have a revelation of somebody coming about two months after his birthday? Who's going to be here after seven on the eighth day? Who when he comes, he's going to be here as the son of man who's going to be rejected for 40 days? Who is going to warn as Jonah did in Luke 11 to the final generation? And when he leaves at the end of the 40 days, they had been warned that Jerusalem is about to be compassed about. And we know it's the one coming from the north, Syria, who is a picture of Ishmael, who comes and destroys at the beginning. And then 13 years later, when it's over, there's another attack. And it's the 14th year that starts. The Lord having returned feet down on the Mount of Olives. 
What did Ishmael have? The beginning of 13, the end of 13? Why, why is Ishmael important to this? You're going to see. Are you following why this is such a big deal? Do you understand that most of the world of church, when Messiah comes and he's here for 40 days, they're going to side with the Muslims unknowingly? Because none of them know the revelation of the Son of Man coming for 40 days after the pre-trib escape. That is why in Luke 17, he said that in this generation, meaning the final generation, he would be rejected. A lot of people say, well, what's he going to do at the end of those 40 days? Where is he going to go? He's going to leave just as he did at the end of the other 40 days. He's not going to get killed by the false prophet and antichrist. Like these guys would tell you. Could you imagine their Messiah, right? The Mahdi and their false prophet who they call Jesus, who are the false prophet. I mean, their prophet who they call Jesus is our antichrist and false prophet. And they say that their prophet and their Messiah, their, their savior is going to kill this person. What kind of savior is that, right? Jesus didn't go around killing these guys. You see, the whole world, this is why Jesus says he must first be rejected. Remember that? That's why in Luke 17, it was, where is it? Okay, this is why in Luke, oh, let me just go to it. This is why it was really important in Luke 17 that you understand this wording. Because again, it goes back to what? But first. What was the but first in Luke? Okay. But before all these things. But first, must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation? He's going to be here as the 40 days, as the 40 days of Noah. We revealed all these things before. It's going to happen between attack one and attack two. It's not going to happen directly on his birthday when he comes to start his 40 days, but it's going to be about two months later. Do you understand why this is such a huge deal? Because this mystery that we were trying to understand for so long, connected to his birth in the beginning, does not change the Father God's beginning, nor the true birth of Christ but reveals that it's about two months later when he comes. Do you understand why this was so important for us in this time? After everything, I knew, and I told you before the previous video, that we knew we still had one more possibility for the end of 70 years, that it would be the count for the house of Judah that would still be completely in line from when they came into the land. Because theirs is Tishri. But it still had to be a count that began in Taurus. It still had to be a count that began in the beginning. But we did not know how on earth it was supposed to be connected to the birth of Christ. Lo and behold, the revelation of the last video showed that it wasn't supposed to be connected directly to his birthday, but about two months after. Right smack dab revealed in the fulfillment of the was and the is that revealed the two month difference of the is to come. Do you understand how crazy powerful that is? How incredibly awesome that is. Do you know what it reveals of what we were looking for here? That it, it, it couldn't have been the time. So not only do we get to now look at the fifth and seventh month with greater reverence and oh my goodness, this is it. But now with the detail in a mystery that has never been understood until this time. That literally brings us 
not to the beginning of the 50. We already had it. But brings us to the beginning of the 40 of the Son of Man. Literally revealed from Scripture. Literally revealed from history. Literally revealed in the first attack, second attack, with his 40 days in between. Literally between the fifth attack month and the attack of the seventh month. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Do you understand Syria's attack, as we've known for years, is the one that comes at the end of 50 days? Which we have shown from all these scriptures is at the year's end. Which is the one from Isaiah 9 when Syria comes. Which means the 40 days of the Son of Man have to be between the Av and Elul count. And the only way that could happen is if there was something we did not yet understand in the timing of his birth that would reveal why he would come on the eighth day about the midst of the month of Av? What on earth was there that could possibly give us a difference of about two months for his birth? Lo and behold. Do you get it? Do you understand why this is such a big deal? This is the over the top final piece of revelation that in my personal opinion, in my mind, in the revelations given through me, revealed by the Spirit leading in the diligently seeking in the revelation of the Lord. is the stamp that seals the deal. What, what more do we need? Well, how about I finish it up with this? What happened in history? This was a good reminder. We've shared this in the past, but our brother Brian shared it in the form again, and it was a good reminder. Okay? What is the ninth of Av, or Tishbav? Okay? Or Tishbav, however they say it. Look what happened in the history. Most people, when they think about the ninth of Av, they relate it to the two attacks that destroyed the first two temples in Jerusalem. Okay? Wait until I show you what else happened. These are the events that happened on the ninth of Av in history, the big events. The spies returned from the promised land. That's interesting, right? Because... Isn't something going to happen, not, not, with the two, not with the spies, but in relation to like the disciples, right? They're going to be girded about. The pre-trib is going to happen. There's going to be a remnant bride remaining to be girded about that, that, that Smyrna group, right? That church of Smyrna workers, the, the Luke 24, the disciple workers that are going to receive the anointing on the 50th day. They got to remain girded about until the Lord returns from the wedding. Then he's going to have that banquet with them briefly on that eighth day. Then he's going to be proclaiming as the Muslims in the world think he's the Dajjal. will be following him as the disciples, those who are the chosen remnant worker bride. They'll follow him. They'll be trying to wake people up. And what do you have this typology? It's like those spying out, right? We're here for those first seven days waiting for his eighth day return. And then what do you get? Well, then they had 40 years in the desert. What do we get? 40 days. So you've got a group spying out, if you will, right? Warning, knowing a destruction's coming. And then the Lord returning for what? 40 days, giving the warning of it? You see, I don't know if you've noticed this theme that's going on throughout the video as well, and has gone out through many other teachings. Days as years, years as days. It's all over the place. Now watch this one, okay? Both temples... Okay, the first and second temple were both destroyed on the ninth of Av. Check this out. This is going to start to blow your mind. The Barcoba revolt against the Romans in 133 CE ended in defeat. Let me show you a little something about that. Do you guys remember this Barcoba revolt, don't you? We've talked about it many, many times. 
in the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Bar Kokhba revolt, the 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 leader, the rabbi that headed it, he had where is his name? Um, oh, usually I can remember his name. The Bar Kokhba revolt was a revolt that took place from 32, so C C32, 132 <clears throat> to 136 CE. And this Bar Kokhba revolt, there was a rabbi, Bakiva, that's it. And Rabbi Bakiva, during this period of this revolt, he wasn't per se a part of this revolt, but he ha he had some siding with this, okay? And he had two groups of 12,000 disciples that were following. What do we know about the Luke group? The two on the road to Emmaus, they're the typology of the good side of Dan and the Ephraim side of the two 12,000s that are missing from the 144,000. That's one of the huge reasons I believe they're the ones that are the remnant bride, 24,000, 12,000, 12,000 that are remaining to work. They're a typology of Rabbi Akiva, that's it, Akiva, and they were the two sets of 12,000. Well, during this time, there was the Bar Kokhba revolt, okay? That told you in 33 AD. Well, it's not precise because it was from 132 to 136, okay? Why is this important? What, what does this matter? Well, you remember that this group of the 12,000, 12,000 is a picture in the typology of the Church of Smyrna. It is a picture of those who will put their necks on the line and they're going to be part of the resurrection at the end to rule and reign with Christ for the millennial reign, which is why they won't be hurt by the second death. Okay? They're the ones who are going to be put to death, put their necks on the line. They are the Priscilla's and the Aquila's who will put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles. These are the Luke 24 typology workers that are going to be there during this time. We know that they worked. And they were called what? The quadradecimate. The quadradecimate, remember I was telling you earlier? They're the ones who were called the original 14thers. The original 14ers stood the ground on the 14th day. Here we are called 14ers, and we're standing on the ground of the 14 years in the truth of the revelation. Who was the leader of the church of Smyrna at that time, the bishop of Smyrna? It was Polycarp. He learned from the Apostle John. So they understood how to count their seasons and times. And he was Bishop of Smyrna from C69 okay, to C155 okay, in the AD, right? In CE. He was with the 14thers and Polycarp himself was a 14ther as Bishop of Smyrna. Who are Smyrna? 14thers, willing to put their necks on the line for the churches of the Gentiles, the Priscilla's and Aquila's. Aquila's name means the eagle. That's the good side of Dan, the overcomer side. You see what I'm saying? This is that same group. <clears throat> well, you're going to want to check this out. This Barcoba revolt. Happened what? This, this connection to it was an event connected to the ninth of Av. Well, lo and behold, who's a group that's left behind purposely? The chosen remnant bride who will know, according to Luke 12, right before the pre-trib happens, and they're going to be left to remain for the seven-day wedding, they're going to be here on the earth and not be a part of the wedding. But when the Lord returns on the eighth day, he's going to have a banquet meal with them at the place he determines. Do you know who they are? Same kind. They're not part of this revolt. They're a group of people that during this period of time when the Son of Man is here coming for 40 days, connected to a group of disciples that are connected to Smyrna that in history represented the same period of time. 
Why am I showing you this? Watch this. Watch this. Do you see this period of time of the Barcoba Revolt? This period of time of the Barcoba Revolt, C-132 to 136 in the CEs, See this C-132, 136? It's during the time of Smyrna. It's the period of time of the church of Smyrna. See that? Remember this? Church of Smyrna, this is the, this is the time when everything's about to begin. The 40 days of the Son of Man, all of that stuff. This is the beginning of the 50. This is the beginning of eight days later. But don't forget, these guys are still here at the beginning of this. And they're going to be told right before it starts. This group, according to Luke 12, is going to be informed first. Then the pre-trib is going to happen. This group of apostles is going to be anointed. They're going to do their thing for those seven days. When the Lord returns on the eighth day, he's going to gather this group and he's going to have a meal with them. And they're going to follow him. He's going to anoint them. He's going to open their understanding. And the whole world is going to reject the Lord during those 40 days. But both of these groups are going to remain during the time of seals at least. You see this time of Smyrna? Remember the time of Polycarp? Okay. Polycarp was right in the midst. The Barcoba revolt was right in the midst of that time. Let me show you something. You see this time right here? Do you guys remember that TV show called The Messiah? A lot of people were against it. Christians were siding unknowingly with Muslims that were saying it was the Dajjal. It's the Dajjal. And Christians were saying it was the Antichrist. It was the Antichrist. It was already a picture of what they were going to be doing. You see this date right here, which is a representation of everything I was showing you? I'm going to show you a screenshot. <clears throat> of that series of a mugshot of this messiah character who was actually the messiah type who they played out in the series purposefully to see what muslims and christians would think of who he was and they both said he was the dajjal and antichrist none of them but us as far as i know realized that he was actually the typology of christ look at this period of time and look at this picture that they gave us on the screen for a second in the midst of the series. Here's the series, and this is images of when he was at the Temple Mount warning, talking to a child and people were coming to see him and everything else. Do you see that? Why on earth do they have the image with the number 132 to 136? Look at this. I took this in 2020, November 3rd, 2020. I took this picture when I saw it. It's from episode Messiah, season one, episode two, Tremor. Look at the number. As a picture of the Son of Man here for 40 days, and the picture is here, and the representation of that period of time is Barcoba Revolt, which is the period of time of Smyrna, when the Son of Man is here for 40 days and they're going to be with him. And the TV show had that number on it that represented the period of time of Smyrna and when the Son of Man is here. Shut the front door. You see? Watch this. How about another thing in history? It was 1290 with the expulsion of England's Jews. How about this one I was saying in the previous video? 1492, banishment of all Jews from Spain, right? That was part of the Mayflower and they all came to America and so forth, right? Or a bunch of them. They, they were part of the ones that paid for the trip, right? So what are we seeing in this? You're seeing the exact timing of this period when the Lord would come. You're seeing this banishment of the Jews being, you know, starting to, to be kicked out of their land. It's not only about this destruction of the temple, okay? It goes beyond that. So now watch this. What is this period of time connected to, okay? We just saw it connects to the timing of with Barcoba Revolt. It's connected with the timing of Smyrna, which is 
from the beginning to when he comes to the eighth day and then they're with him for 40 days. We see it's in a series that's connected to this period of time. We see that this is when they should start to realize to start fleeing from the land, even though the warning hasn't come yet, but northern Israel's been attacked. You would think that's enough to get them going, but we know the Son of Man comes about the eighth day and the warnings will begin before the Syria attack comes. All of this is related to these periods of time in history at the ninth of Av. Well, now I'm going to show you another one. We know that at the end of the 40 days of the Son of Man, the Lord told, the angel said, not many days from now, that they would be filled by the Holy Ghost at Pentecost. We know this is the 50th day, and it's all about new wine. Okay? Not that they were drunk on it, but they were accused of being drunk on new wine. This new wine, we've come to reveal and show that new wine isn't harvested until about mid-September. It's actually throughout this period of time right here. And what did we discover about this? We discovered that the world's largest new wine, the, new, the festival of new wine that happens every year since the 1400s. It started, see, 590 years ago, just like the loaves of bread, late July to the very first of August is the time of the leavened bread brought into the temple for hundreds of years, almost 600 years, they've been celebrating new wine in September in this period of time right here. When is the 50th day we're saying? Is right here. Why is it important? Wait till you see the rest of this story. We know it's Acts chapter two, full of new wine, right? Well, what about the fasting in the morning? of the seventh month that relates to the attack that killed Gedalia, right? Well, we know it has to be something with new wine. What about the fast of Gedalia? Look what happened. On Rosh Hashanah, Ishmael came to Gedalia with 10 men ostensibly to celebrate the holiday with them. You see, because it was Rosh Hashanah. While they were eating together, Ishmael, and his men got up and killed Gedalia. Who did it? Ishmael did it, right? Ishmael did it. Well, let's go have a look at this in Jeremiah chapter 40. I'm almost done. In Jeremiah chapter 40, are you ready for this? I don't know if you are. Let's go to chapter 40, verse 12. Uh, verse 12. You ready? You ready? Even all the Jews returned out of all places whither they were driven and came to the land of Judah to Gedalia unto Mizpah, right? The tower and look at this. Gathered wine and summer fruits very much. What? What? They gathered wine. They gathered wine at the time of Gedalia slaying, who was killed by Ishmael, and the time of this gathering of wine is happening during the time of gathering and celebrating with wine. That celebration that's been going on for 600 years goes from the 9th of September to the 19th of September. And this day is the 50th day of new wine. And this is the day that they were all there gathered about drinking, banqueting wine when Gedalia is killed by Ishmael. Wow, this must just be a coincidence. Do you think maybe it's a coincidence? Now it came to pass in the seventh month. It was the first day of the seventh month, you see? That's what it was telling you. It happened on Rosh Hashanah, but they're not going to 
observe it on Rosh Hashanah because it's Rosh Hashanah. So now they observe it on the third day, but it happened on the first day. Who did it? Ishmael. Who was Ishmael? The type of the king of the north with Syria, who comes on the 50th day at the year's end, at the turn of the year, and it's Tishri. What more do we need? It's the revelation of when they fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years. Bam! 50 days apart. Attack one. Attack two. Attack one is at the time of the end of the wheat harvest when the loaves of bread are made with leaven and brought into the temple. And at the end of 50 days, it's new wine that they're accused of having been drunk on in the midst of a new wine festival for hundreds of years. And at the time when they went in to pretend to be eating and drinking and being merry with them, they brought wine, banqueting wine, in with them. Are you getting the picture? We were never to count from all the way back here. The end of the wheat harvest is late July to August. The end of the wine harvest and the banqueting of the wine is in the midst of September. And both of those have been so for hundreds and hundreds of years. So much so that they had actually even gathered wine and summer fruits. Do you get it? Are you following? Every single part and piece of this is connected with the beginning of the 14 years, starting with wine. The attack connected to wine. The year's end first attack. And what happens at the end of 13 years? It's at the year's end with the second attack. And do you remember what happens at the end of those 70 years when the final 70 is then completed? Do you remember what it said? That when those 70 are done, he's going to destroy Babylon? And what did we see happened in the destruction of Babylon in Revelation in the last video? It's the what? It's the time of what? The treading of the grapes? Do you remember that? As they treadeth the grapes? Brothers and sisters, this is, this is the 50th day, Holy Ghost anointing in the end of 70 years. This is the second attack that will remove the Jews. And the only piece out of all of this that we missed, that we had never understood, out of all of the rest of these things that we have taught and gone through and revealed and connected from creation to revelation, from beginning to end, in the revelation of all of the beginning being the end, and yet this being the birth of Christ. One piece that we were missing that would bring it all together was hidden in the revelation of what we understood in Isaiah 9, revealed in Matthew chapter 4. The difference, my brothers and sisters, was two months. Do I believe with all of my heart that we are here? I do. Can I tell you with 100% certainty? No. Can I tell you from revelation of everything that I've come to reveal and been revealed and understood and studied in all of this time? 
Do I believe it's so? I've gone through this with a fine-tooth comb, and I don't have a single glitch in it. The only glitch that this would have been was how on earth is this connected to the Son of Man's birth? I don't need that anymore. We know the difference was two months. Brothers and sisters, I pray you keep watching. I pray you keep praying, that you keep diligently seeking the Lord, that you be strong, that you be encouraged, that you be in strength, that you be strengthened through the revelations, through the teachings. Seek them out, search them out. Go to the website, read the book. Know that we still have about, you know, 30 some odd days left and know that you can continue to support the ministry, that we can continue to bless and bring about salvation and revelation and understanding to those in Uganda for our brother Steve as well. He has another event coming up uh, the 5th and 7th of June. So it would be nice to be able to help him get books printed, get Bibles ordered, and let them be prepared for this great big mission that's coming up here uh, uh, early in, sorry, I said June, uh, in July. All right, brothers and sisters, this is awesome. I believe we have just sealed the deal. It is done. We have brought it from the beginning. We have brought it to the end. From the beginning of tribulation to the end of tribulation, the entire story is a fractal. It is revealed. I believe we're here with all of my heart. We have got the revelation of the timing. Of that, I have no doubt. All I seek to understand is this truly the 70th year. And everything that we have gone through scripturally, everything that we have gone through historically is telling us, yes, it is. So brothers and sisters, we will keep watching. We will keep praying. I will do everything I can to keep strengthening you, lifting you up in teachings and in revelations and in sharing. You can join us in the website. You can go to the forum, sign up, take you a few seconds. It's free and join 11, 1200 people around the world sharing all sorts of great things. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.